Microphone, we'd like to call to order the Malibu Planning Commission regular meeting for March 2, 2020. Can you call the roll, please? Commissioner Marks? Commissioner Uring? Here. Commissioner Weil? Here. Vice Chair Maza? Here. Chair Jennings? Here. You have a quorum with Commissioner Marks absent. Uh, Dennis, Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm looking for a motion for the approval of the agenda. John? I move the agenda as recommended with item 3B1 continued to March 16th, item 4A continued to March 16th, item 5B continued to March 16th, item 5G committed to April 6th, item 8, 5H to April 6th. May I uh, also request that we move item 6A, the parking house up so that it can be considered uh, in conjunction with So that would be to move it directly in front of that item to be heard right before it? Yes. Okay, I, I, that's okay with me, John. I'll prove that. All right. What, we, what are we going to do now? They're going to move the so the, host together. They're not gonna move, we're not going to hear them together. They're going to be separate. Yeah, you're going to hear the report first, Fine. and then I, after I the report. Why aren't you separate? Okay. okay. Um, so the only new item in this is, is the item 3B1, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, formula retail question, and that's going to be, if you're here for that, it's being continued. All right, I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Um, okay, so now I guess what we do is get a report on the posting of the agenda. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on February 21st, 2020, with the amended agenda posted on February 26th, 2020. Okay, thank you. Now, who's going to administer the oath of office to our newly appointed... Uh, Commissioner. I Is shall. You? Okay. Take it away. Uh, David Whale, please stand, raise your right hand, and repeat after me. I, please state your name. I, David Weil. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will diligently serve as planning commissioner of the city of Malibu. That I will diligently serve as planning commissioner of the city of Malibu. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Thank you. Congratulations. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Next on the uh, agenda is the staff update on the Woolsey Fire rebuild process. Richard, take it away. Good evening, Chair Jennings and members of the Planning Commission. I'll give you just a quick update on where we are. The numbers you see on this page here represent what we have approved. We've approved the replacement of 62 homes that are like for like, so those would be homes that are either what they were uh, prior to the fire or they're replacing it with something smaller. The bulk of the applications has been for like for like plus 10% additions. And so far we've approved 15 that are major changes uh, these would be ones that have applied for either a coastal development permit or have, they've gone and done something that, re sh that uh, shifts the footprint around. 
and require some extra review. The, the various line uh, bar graphs here, what they're showing us is the volume of applications. The light blue color, those are planning verifications. Those are where folks have applied for an over-the-counter review of their home because they're putting back what they had, either exactly or up to 10%. Those applications have dropped off. They've, the, this last month, February, we had two more than we had in January, but as you can see, overall the numbers are low currently. We have been, uh, continue to uh, administer the fee waiver program as approved by the City Council. To date, we have waived $2.2 million worth of fees. This is both uh, fees for the planning process and also the building and safety portion of the project. Currently, the fee waiver program, um, as approved, is looking is till the 30th of June. However, there's a possibility of that being extended for the purposes of building and safety. Uh, that is currently up for discussion with the City Council. The Building and Safety Department is currently looking at uh, the issuance of 71 building permits. So those are for fire replacement homes. These are not for fire replacement accessory structures, just strictly homes. There are 71 building permits that are active. Two homes have been completed and they have another 77 projects that are in the plan check process. They are gonna be reaching out to the other 60 to 70 applications that the planning department has approved but has not uh, been submitted yet to building and safety for the plan check process. Also would like to remind folks that there is a community wildlife protection plan program that's taking place. This information is on the city's website. The areas that you see in blue, those are links uh, that if someone either contacts us at the fire rebuild table, we can provide them that via an email, or you could see at the bottom there, we have a place for uh, for folks to go online and participate in a survey. It's on our city's website, malibucity.org forward slash wildfire plan survey. If anybody is having a hard time receiving public notices or they have questions about the process, uh, a place to uh, make contact with city with city officials is to contact Kathleen Stecco, our planning commission recording secretary. And Kathleen can then put uh, the person on the email chains that the city sends out for items relating to the fire. Or if we have to, we can also um, make a phone call too to them. But if someone is having difficulty registering with the city, um, it's best to contact Kathleen and she'll see that your name makes it into our database. I'm available for any questions if there are any. I just wanna um, add on to Richard's last comment that uh, one of the things we've become aware of is that uh, some property owners have, who have been displaced and have a new mailing address or have moved several times um, may have difficulty getting um, mailed notices from us. And so we just wanna make sure that anybody who wishes to receive um, notices by email can certainly do that. We can um, just add you into our database. Kathleen can take, a, take care of that and so that might be a simpler and actually faster way to get notice of um, developments around you or public hearings or anything like that than uh, waiting on the regular mail. Okay. Thank you. Comments? Steve? Uh, just, we sort of touched in this last meeting, Richard. Of the total number of homes that burnt, how many of those people have we not been able to contact? There are approximately just homes. Uh, I feel with certainty based on the numbers that we've seen in our department, we've probably contacted, I can say we've contacted about 230 folks as an estimate. There's approximately 200 people that we still need to look for for applications or, or they could also be selling the property. But we are trying to make contact with them. We'll, we're doing a second round using the information that we have, which is um, if we can find phone numbers from uh, perhaps they've done business with the city in the past, so we're looking through our database, and then also using whatever information the assessor has. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, John. Richard, um, <coughs> I've noticed in the last month or so quite a few uh, chain link fences going up all over town. Um, when you check the rebuilds, are you requiring them to uh, maintain the open fences on uh, rebuilt if they didn't have a fence before? Yes, any new fencing would have to comply with the city's current codes unless we can find proof uh, that they had a non-conforming fence that was destroyed by the fire, in which case that could be replaced under the exemption uh, that will run through November 8th of this year. Uh, November 8th of this year is the deadline for the ability to replace any of your non-conformities without having to request an extension from the Planning Commission. Thank you. David? Okay. I will just um, sort of confirm what uh, your sense is about the mail having moved a couple of times. I'm still getting mail at all of those addresses, so um, it is confusing. Um, now we're at written and oral communications from the public. Have I got a slip? Um, before we do that, I would like to just make a couple of announcements. Okay. Um, oh, no. Sorry, I'm jumping the gun. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike Pearson, you have terrible handwriting. No wonder you could... No, I'm a lefty, and it just like when I'm tired, it just doesn't happen on the writing. So, Mickey. Mikey Pearson, go ahead. Three Thank minutes. Thank you. Um, I just want to take a moment and welcome David and say thank you for all the hard work you put in already, and welcome you aboard. And um, also take a, a moment to thank staff very much for going out of their way to uh, help David, help him get him up and running. Very much appreciate it, and thank you to the applicants that um, accommodated so he could get out to your projects, and uh, just want to wish you the best, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Adam Friedman. Good evening, Planning Commission. Thank you for having me here today. I am appearing on behalf of a company I work for called Homebound. We are a technology-enabled home builder helping the Malibu community rebuild. Um, we were doing so from end to end. So we are here to help the community in any way they, they need. Uh, we help them understand their insurance. We have an in-house insurance specialist who helps people understand their budget, what the opportunities are, what the possibilities are with that. So if anyone is stuck in their insurance process and are sort of in a stalemate figuring out how to rebuild, we offer some resources there. We have in-house uh, architecture. Uh, we have a network of consultants we work with as well. And we are a home builder. We are a licensed contractor. We're working with about 15 uh, Malibu or Malibu County residents, or LA County residents. And we're here to help really in any way we can. I'm here also with our head of construction, John Bell, and our area manager, Steve Meyer. Um, and we are really here to be of service to the community. So if anyone has any questions or is uh, hitting any roadblocks in their rebuilding process, um, we are here to help. I think some of my colleagues have appeared here before you all, so thank you for their, your hospitality. Um, I will give back the, remaining, the remainder of my time, but just wanted to say thank you all for the opportunity. Congratulations as well uh, to Commissioner Weil, and uh, thank you all. Do you want to tell people how to reach you if they're interested in contacting yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can go visit uh, www.homebound.com. We'll be here for the balance of the planning meeting, and I have some cards. I'm happy to leave some cards up here at the podium if that's appropriate. Probably not. Okay. Maybe. Well, then they're available uh, outside, or please come, come over and say hello. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. We're now at uh, Planning Commission's staff comments and inquiries. Uh, Steve, anything? One, Barney, a ways back we talked about the... Uh, Policy 43, which was going to be rewritten or readdressed so we understand exactly what it's supposed to, to mean. Uh, I'm sure you don't have it tonight, but just keep that on your radar screen if you could. That's the um, the code in, the city council's code enforcement policy. Right. Right. Trevor, do you want to comment on that? I'm not sure what being brought back on that since that's, I mean, this is not a code enforcement body. What 
what was the commission looking for on, on the what look the policy the original policy okay we're, we're trying to figure out what the policy is supposed to be at one point if you turn somebody in you had to ignore they could give your name out as the person who turned them in in the last situation we had this city said they don't have to turn your name in you can complain anonymously and just trying to figure out what the rules are well, so we're just looking for a report on what the rules are. Just if you're just looking for a report of what of what the policy 43 is, I mean, it says what it says. I mean, this is it's not a it's, it's not an item that the commission it's not a commission policy. I don't, so I'm confused what we're looking to do here. What I'm looking to do is under look one and we brought it up last time. We've got rules that aren't in right or being in, using they're not in writing, so nobody understands what the rules are supposed to be. If you read the policy 43, it says that your complaint is anonymous, is, is going to be recorded, right? So if I complain that you've got doing something, they can give my name as the person who complained. When it happened, that he said that the complainer was anonymous. I'm just trying to figure out which one it is. And we should, it should be in writing so people know. Okay. I mean, the, the policy says what it says. I mean, But the policy is not what we're doing. That's my point. Well, if it's, if it's an issue about how the policy is being enforced, I mean, that's an item for the city council. You can raise it to the city council. But if it's just what the policy is, I mean, the policy is stated by what's on the paper. Okay. So if, if there have further questions, you can go talk Got to it. staff. Okay. Uh, John. Yes. <clears throat> I'd like to thank, uh, well, welcome David, and thank Craig Hill for all the work he did. Um, it is a lot of work, as David just figured out. Uh, in fact, this week, I put well over 20 hours into it. So it, it does interfere with your life, and uh, I hope people understand that. And I, I, and I know Craig put a lot of time in, and I think David will enjoy his time. So I just wanted to uh, mention that. Thank you. David? I just want to second Mikey's comments and, and thank Bonnie and the staff for putting up with me this week and pointing me in the right direction and uh, answering my 10,000 questions and it's an enormous help and I promise not to continue it into the future. Okay, I want to add uh, to what John said about um, thanking Craig. He, he did a very bright guy. He worked very, very hard and I appreciate the, offer, the effort he put into the job. Um, staff, comments? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a few brief announcements. Um, first, I uh, just wanted to inform everybody that Southern California Edison is beginning their annual um, vegetation maintenance program, the tree trimming. Um, we've, we're still implementing uh, the same program. We worked out with them last year about um, having them coordinate with our city arborist consultant about um, any identifying ahead of time any protected trees so that we can make sure that um, you know, trimming is not done in a way that um, requires a CDP without getting a CDP. Last year, they were able to um, avoid the need for any CDPs by uh, just maintaining to the previous cuts, which was um, which is consistent with the local coastal program. So, um, just wanted you to know that was beginning. Um, on Saturday, I attended a workshop held by the uh, Resource Conservation District of the Santa Monica Mountains um, about a project to restore the Topanga Lagoon. Um, this, is, this was the first public meeting on this project. Um, the project has a, a pretty long timeline. They don't expect to actually start any sort of work or construction for like seven years because of all the planning and the environmental studies and permitting and things that will ultimately be needed. But um, if you're interested in this project, it's it, the boundaries are basically right from the, the eastern city limits to um, Topanga Canyon Boulevard. Um, and so there's you know a lot of public area, public open space there. There's some businesses there. Um, it's it's really interesting. I didn't realize there had been a lagoon before. So um, keep your eyes open for uh, that. You can also um, go to the Resource Conservation District's website and um, get more information. Um, let's see, we talked about the email notification process. Um, we are 
trying to coordinate a meeting of the City Council Zoning Ordinance Revisions and Code Enforcement Subcommittee, formerly referred to as ZORASIS, um, for March 17th. Um, we want to, um, we had tried several times to schedule a meeting to talk about um, code amendments to address parking as a standalone use. Um, that's the item that we're um, preparing to bring back. The meetings uh, previously were um, canceled. I think uh, council members weren't uh, able to attend, but we'll be getting a staff report prepared and posted on that soon. Um, let's see, I also wanted to make sure everybody is aware of the city council's um, efforts at um, addressing the possibility of district-based elections in Malibu. Um, a demographer has been hired and um, the city council has upcoming public hearings on potential draft maps that would create new voter districts for city council elections. Um, the next uh, public hearing on this is March 12th at 6 p.m. in the city council chambers. And then there will be also be a meeting March 13th at 6 p.m. at Malibu High School. Um, the city has a web page. It's malibucity.org slash district elections. And um, that's where the draft maps will be posted and you can get more information on this process. Yeah, th that meeting is really important because the actual draft maps will start, will be appearing at those meetings. Okay, that's John. Um, Bonnie, the uh, ADU, I assume is gonna be pretty complicated and pretty long. Is there, is there any way we can get something as soon as we can, for example, maybe the, the state law or something that isn't part of your staff report so we can get up to speed? Because uh, it's, it it's has, be it has proven to be quite complex. Um, yes, let me look into that. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I would love to do a special meeting just for this topic because of the complexity of it. Um, I know we've already got one special meeting coming up for short-term rentals, um, but yes, we'll we'll try to get you some uh, advanced information. Thank you. I, I think um, if you go on Richard Bloom's uh, site on um, Twitter, actually, he has a listing of the of the statutes that are uh, the four statutes that are that are being brought before us. So if you can't get it from staff, you can. Get it from Richard Bloom's office, or just look it up on the web. I'm, yeah, I'm it's, too, um, uh, I'm it's too on old the to city. Twitter is. Ah, well, <laughs> I won't explain it to you. Um, we, we do have information on the city's website, yeah. but we can try to make it, you know, a little more kind of coordinated for you, because it is um, the the challenge has been trying to mesh the the housing law requirements with the local coastal program, and um, I don't think any other coastal cities, as far as we're aware, have have achieved this yet as far as moving forward with their ordinances. So um, I think it's it's not just us <laughs> that are having a challenge. Well, let me ask you this. The, the, in the past, the last iteration of this, this ADU stuff uh, exempted the coastal zone from being coerced into complying. Is that exemption for the coastal zone still in effect or are we going to be subject to the same rules as everybody else? It's um, that that part of the the law did not change. So, it's but it's, it's not an exemption. It's not an exemption, though. That's the, there the are certain challenge. procedural requirements that we'll have to comply with, and there's some leeway. Right. right. So we'll get we'll get into that when we get into it. Um, all right. So we're at the consent calendar now. Are there items that anybody wishes to pull from the long consent calendar? I. I'm sorry. I'd like to pull three a two. And 3B2. 3. And uh, we have a request from the public to poll 3A1. I'd like to poll 3A4. <laughs> 3A4. Done. 3B1 is gone, right? 3B1 is continued. So what does that leave us with? 3A1 is, is, is pulled. 3B2 is pulled. 3B3 could be go forward. 
CA3 so yeah, A3 and 3B3 will be the items that are remaining on the consent calendar. Okay. There's a motion. Okay, I'm looking for a motion on uh, three on the remaining items of the consent calendar. I move we uh, three consent A3. to 3A3. Three, uh, 3B3. 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 Is there a second? Uh, I've been advised to. Uh, Abstain on, on any of the consent calendar. Right, right. The record will reflect I'll that since you weren't here. That's moved and seconded. All in favor of the Aye. three with one abstention. Okay. All right. So three, let's go back to the beginning. Three A one. And we have Norm Haney, Fred Gaines, Harry Kim, and Dennis Smith, who gives a minute to Norm. Uh, Kim, a minute to Norm. Uh, okay, so Norm, you have um, five minutes, or is Fred speaking, or is he giving his minute to you? He's going to give a minute to me, thank you. Okay, so you've got six minutes. Uh, good, good morning or uh, evening, uh, Commissioners, um, and uh, welcome, Commissioner Weil. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with everyone up here that has said that uh, Craig Hill made a real effort uh, to research all of the issues and bring them all to the Planning Commission. I didn't always agree with his position, but I don't think anyone can argue with the amount of time and effort that he put into it. And uh, because of that, um, I, uh, I appreciate his, his time. <clears throat> so, approximately four weeks ago, there was a project up in front of the Planning Commission. There's a resolution here tonight. And I don't think the resolution uh, is appropriate. And, and I blame myself for that. Because during the hearing on 34 soldier piles, I focused on 20 soldier piles that were along the top of the coastal bluff. Um, when in fact, I should have been focusing more on the 14 soldier piles that were not on a coastal bluff, the bluff that was not subject to wave uprush, and which uh, was completely different than the 20 piles which will eventually be exposed, which is one of the primary issues. And the other issue is that eventually uh, it's going to have a negative impact on the natural landward progression of the shoreline. Uh, Craig mentioned that eventually, and we don't know if it's going to be 100 years, 200 years, or 1,000 years, it will be a, uh, a resistance to wave uprush and the natural progression of the shoreline. Um, I prepared a very short uh, statement um, and some pictures. And let's see here. All right. Last week, the project geologist <coughs> uh, prepared a report that focuses on only the 14 piles. And the yellow portion of this says that the 14 piles will be exposed at some time in the future, but the future is somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 years. And that is because of the mechanism that is different between a slope failure, coastal bluff slope failure, versus a a slide that occurs as a result of one strata slipping across another slata, uh, strata. Now, <clears throat> let me move on here. Okay, you see the orange? This is a coastal bluff, and the orange represents erosion at the very toe. After that occurs, the support for the heavy bluff that's above that simply collapses and shears through all the strata. That's what moves the coastal bluff 
inland much faster. Okay, this, this is called a planar pseudostatic uh, slide plane. You can see that the strata slopes towards the property uh, to the north and it includes the house. This is basically at a 1.025. If there is a major landslide, this strata is gonna slide off onto the neighbor's property. The vertical blue line represents where the pile would be virtually cutting the, driver, the driving force in half. Entirely different mechanism for a slide. And if we have a major earthquake, this could happen and destroy the house. Now, it will be put back again, ultimately, but it'll be put back again with retaining walls that are visible and soldier piles that support the uh, retaining walls. <clears throat> this is uh, a picture of the soldier piles. It's very hard to see. Um, let's see if I've got Right here, the soldier piles are shown here. This is the 20. These are the 14. And this is how it will slide. It'll slide off into the ravine onto the neighbor's property in a major landslide. Now, the, we have four geotechnical engineers, geologists, two work for the uh, city of Malibu, and two are hired, they all say that these, this subterranean soldier pile wall should be constructed to protect the house, also to protect the neighbor's property. So I would like to have this issue reconsidered with regard to the 14 soldier piles. It's a different mechanism than the original 20. My time's up. I'll leave it there. I need unfortunately, all the people to support a reconsideration that are here. What? Uh, actually, I need two. Thank, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And I could help. Uh, okay. Um, Norm called me today and asked if I what I knew about motions for reconsideration, and my memory is that a motion for reconsideration, um, according to the Roberts rules, can be made, but it has to be made if it's to be made by somebody who voted in favor of the motion that passed and was approved. Uh, in other words, since you were on the side that voted to, to uh, the decision that was made, you could make the motion and I voted against it, so I couldn't. Um, I assume that what would have to happen is that if a motion for reconsideration were to be brought up, then we would have to recalendar the, the item for a further hearing because we couldn't take it up now. We'd have to. to yeah, this has not been noticed for a, a public hearing. So this right. is usually just to uh, memorialize the decision that was previously made by the commission. Okay, before we get to the to asking about that, I, one of the things that I wanted to um, have corrected in the original version that was submitted to us was to show what the vote was on the motion to deny. And I, I didn't get this until late today, so I just want to make sure that that's in there. And yes, we added that to um, the recital L on page two. Um, voted three to two, Jennings and Marks dissenting. Okay, uh, so is there anybody interested in making a motion to reconsider? First, uh, is it, uh, Trevor, is Jeff correct? You're our lawyer. Well, the, I would recommend against opening this up for reconsideration. That's been the practice the, of the commission over a significant period of time is that when a decision is made that it's brought back just for memorialization, not for reopening of the hearing, it's likely to lead to everyone trying to reopen their decision anytime there's a decision that's brought back for approval at a later period of time. <laughs> if the commission does not approve the decision, though, then it, it could be set for a future hearing. So. Norm? Is, has the property been trenched and is there a uh, uh, earthquake zone on that property? I'm sorry, would you state that again, Commissioner Is Mazza? there a earthquake fault on that property? 
Not to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, when you say large earthquake, do you mean five, four, five, six, seven, eight? Do you know what that is? Yes, somewhere between six and a half and eight. Okay, so really on the Richter, big, really big guy. Pardon? A really big one. One that is we're overdue for. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, just to reiterate, what what we are typically doing when we bring these matters back, when we bring a resolution back after a, uh, a matter has been heard and voted on, all we're really looking for is to is to determine whether the resolution that's been submitted to us accurately reflects the action that we took. Um, at the previous meeting. So I'm looking for a motion of one sort or another, uh, whether it's a motion to reconsider or a motion to just approve the, the uh, resolution as presented. I'm going to make a motion to uh, approve the motion as considered. Okay, is there a second? A second. Um, all right. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Weil will be abstaining. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that concludes item and, three. And just one, the, the reason I voted to not do that is because a couple of weeks ago we had somebody else come before us, the guy that had the uh, mm -hmm. thing in front of his house, the, the mound across PCH, and we told him he couldn't do it. So I just think we got to treat everybody equally. Well, no, I agree <laughs> with, with Trevor that, I mean, you can do it. It's just right. I agree with Trevor that it, it right, would I'm, naturally lead to uh, The last guy we business. said no, so I figured... Okay. And okay. I'd I'll also like to comment that I agree with what, why we're doing this, but I also could consider if I considered it a major probability, and I think there are hundreds to thousands of lots in Malibu, which would slide mainly all of Big Rock if we had a, a 6.5 to 8. So it's okay. been taken. We're at 3A2. 3A2 is the item you asked to be pulled, Steve? Yes, and I just got two items I want to talk about on page two of two, two of three. Uh, the per coastal development permit findings for denial. The, the first one, the project fails to comply with the LCP and the, and the Malibu Municipal Code. Uh, there were two different computations for the two-thirds rule, uh, and I, this, I think they're different. They provide different results depending upon how they're applied. So I think it should say should comply with the LCP and the Malibu Municipal Code, and then specifically the architectural plans do not comply with the two-thirds rule, local implementation plan, LP 3.6.K2, and the Malibu Municipal Code, whatever the right reference for that is. We should have both of those in there. I'd also like to comment. John. I'm not here. One more jump before I'm done. Oh, you want to do that? Yeah. You got that one, Trevor? Okay, the, yes. sec the second one is, uh, and I just think the wording's wrong, all the required findings to grant the site cannot be made. Specifically, the project will adversely affect neighborhood character due to the amount of building square footage proposed, which is significantly greater than that shown on the LA County Assessors. Now, this was Craig Hill's motion, uh, so I'm tr but I don't think that's, I think what he just said, it, it, in comparison to the other houses in the neighborhood, this was too large. I don't think it had anything to do with what the assessor said. The, uh, significant, the square footage is significantly greater than the neighboring properties? Than neighboring properties. Okay. I agree. That's it. You want to put that in the form of a motion? I would like to make a motion to make those changes that I just gave to Trevor. Okay. So the changes are to uh, alter section 3.1 to say the project fails to comply with the LCP and Malibu Municipal Code, specifically architectural plans, do not comply with the two-thirds rule, parentheses, LIP section 3.6K2, and then we're going to add in the Malibu Municipal Code section dealing with the two-thirds rule. Yes. And then for the second one, um, it would be, uh, again, section 3, um, subsection 2, and in the second sentence, we're going to cross out um, the part starting with that shown in the Los Angeles County Assessor's website for surrounding properties and add in the neighboring properties. So it'll now read, um, specifically the project will adversely affect neighborhood character due to the amount of building square footage proposed, which is significantly greater than the surrounding properties. Yes. 
That's the motion. Is there, is there a second? I'll second it. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Uh, aye. Uh, aye. Uh, the with with uh, Commissioner Weil abstaining. Um, you had something else you wanted to raise on that one? John, you had John? No, that was oh. last in. That's what I was going to do. Okay, so we've done number three and number four. Three A four. The wine tasting ah. project that who pulled that I wrote down pull but I didn't write down who did it who said probably me okay oh, probably <laughs> okay okay uh, as a just to go back in time a little I was involved in what was called measure R which was turned down by the appellate court for the fact that uh, CUPs were granted under that measure to the individual user instead of the landowner. And they go with the land. Now, in looking at this, uh, condition 31, number 2, 31, and 15 appear to me, let me find them, uh, to, whoops, 3A4 appear to give this CUP only to the wine apothecary because uh, condition okay for example LIP implement measure on page four of nine says location within the Fred Siegel affords wine apothecary not a wine store, wine apothecary, the opportunity to market products that are smaller, smaller footprint, and no, and no other wine may be sold other than theirs. Okay, so that that means nobody else can do it but them. Um, and then you go to uh, you go to condition two. That's preceding conditions. Uh, number two says approve the operation of the wine apothecary. Okay. Not liquor store. Okay, I think we can get the point. Let's get. Well, then there's a couple others that are very specific. Um, Let, let's. I, they're, they're all the general same problem, right? Directing to, to the wine apothecary rather than to the property owner. No, uh, the the other one is that it that means it can only be the wine apothecary, and then it cannot be replaced. So, Commission 30, 31 and thirty two say. It, it can be revocated, but it doesn't say. It says only under those conditions can be revocated, which means the wine apothecary is a violation if they leave. So it's revoked in six months. So it, the landlord has no control, uh, and it doesn't go with the land because if the tenant leaves, you can't replace it. So, so I think that to make this legal. I know I lost four to one on this vote. I admit that. I think that we need to change the language to take out wine apothecary and put some more general language in there. Well, the problem um, is like we had in the first one. The, our job here is to determine whether what the resolution says reflects accurately what we did. And, and um, we, I know we discussed this issue during the hearing uh, about the, the nature, who was the applicant and who did the... Who did the uh, permit run to, and all the rest of that stuff? Do you want to? Can you uh, expand on that a little bit? Yeah, uh, you know, you can make a change here if you want. I don't think it's going to be interpreted if this was brought forward in the future that any other wine tasting business uh, would have the same rights as the apothecary wines. But if you want to substitute the name apothecary wines with wine tasting business, um, that would be acceptable to do the same thing. So it, it's up to the commission's but, pleasure if it wants to be. If, if that happens, what happens if this guy goes belly up and it doesn't work? If, if he goes belly up and doesn't work, another wine tasting business would be able to come in with a um, planning clearance to show that the new business is going to comply with all the CUP. That's but if we made that change you recommended? It would happen either way because you can't make a, a CUP that's limited to one specific person. It runs with the land. It's a type of use that's allowed in the land. So this wine tasting business is what's being allowed. So it's being run by apothecary wines here. It could be run by Terlato wines or 
any other people. If this reads apothecary wine, doesn't that mean that if he goes belly up, this doesn't apply to anybody else? Is that, that what it No, says? it would, it would an, another, another wine tasting business could come in. Under case laws like Goat Hill, you can't make a, a CUP specific to one particular person. It has to be a use that's allowed on the land itself. So if they go out of business and they don't operate for six months, then it can be revoked and, and uh, the, the use terminated. But um, anytime you're doing a CUP, you're authorizing a specific type of use, as j just as any other restaurant can substitute in when you approve a restaurant to move back into the same space with the CUP. So would, we could, would they have to, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, we could substitute every mention of wine apothecary for a, a wine tasting business. In business in that. Would that take care of your problem, John? Well, yeah, I'm just wondering what we do about, uh, do we have to change it to limit it to wines only sold, or would that be included? It's already, it's it, already, it's already part of the license. Already. So yeah. the only person that could come in is, Someone else uh, with the same you know, license. strange wines, and they only sold strange wines. Yes, they'd have to sell their own wines. They'd have to have the same type of license. The license. They have the same exact conditions. It should be a different winery. And... Um, how do we know, and this is just a general question, not specific to this, is the planning department going to tell us when six months comes up, or is it up, us, up to somebody to turn it in, or how does that work? Because we don't really have people running around seeing which business is where since we have no business licenses. Yeah, it's... Well, it's always difficult, you know, in terms of when those determine exactly when someone seizes operation. So someone could report it or it could be a product of inspection, you know, from the city as well. Would we be notified by the ABC that the license was canceled? I don't know if we get notified. Do we get notification on that? I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think so. We get noticed when there's a new license proposed. But the only, only reason I ask this is we had a winery, same situation. It went out of business. That never got revoked, and then we approved a business that required that there be no wine store in that building. And so we got ourselves in trouble because we had to ex post facto or whatever it is, uh, delete the other, other permit. Well, we have a very, I will say, full, somewhere between full and delusional agenda tonight. So um, if we could. Um, well, you guys, have, you guys have the vote, so you choose which way you want to do it. I, I just was trying to follow the law. I'm, so, I'm hoping John could, it was his issue, so how do you want to solve it, John? What, well, Trevor? The change would be to substitute in the conditions wherever it specifies apothecary wines and instead stay a wine tasting business. You okay with that? I'm fine with that. Then let's do that. Okay. Uh, that's your motion? Yes. yes. I, I second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous with Mr. Weil abstaining. That concludes um, 3A4. We're now at 3B2. Steve, this is yours. Yeah, I just uh, like, to have this, like to pull this and bring it back for two reasons. One, uh, this week I got a bunch of calls from some of the neighbors who were just, you know, concerned about the size. Don't know if the coming back is going to change that, but they asked us to at least address that. So I'd like you to accommodate them. And the second thing I'd like is because uh, I asked for a sort of a recalc on the two-thirds rule and got a response back that I just doesn't make any sense to me. So as opposed to sitting here and trying to do it tonight, I'd like to bring it back and go through a full review of it. Okay, the issue here is that this is an administrative coastal development permit, and so the question is whether there are th three votes, um, or actually no, uh, you can you can weigh in on this one, uh, votes to um, to bring this back for a full coastal development. Come on up. Let ah. the record reflect that Commissioner Marks has joined us. And Chris, we're on three B two. Uh, the appeal period on the 3As, is that? Yes, it, it, it runs from the actions. The action is taken today. That's when the appeal period would start running. Thank you. Okay. okay. So we're at, uh, we're on uh, 3B2, which is uh, uh, administrative coastal development permit. The issue is whether there are enough votes or three votes to 
bring the matter back for a full CDP or whether the administrative uh, coastal permit issued will be received and filed. Um, and so you've heard Steve make his remarks? Yes. Okay. Um, any comment, John? I'll move the item to come back. I'd, I'd second. Uh, moved and seconded. Uh, David? Anything? There, were there any speakers on this one? No, no comment. Okay. Do we, uh, do we have any speakers on this? Um, I don't have any in front of me. Okay. Speakers? Yeah, you can, you can speak if you want to. Yeah. This is, the, the question is whether it's to be brought back for a full CDP. And if you wish to speak, if you're the applicant or anybody else for that matter, if you wish to be heard on this, come forward. You have a speaker slip there that yeah, you can give it to Catherine. Do we have any disclosures? None. Okay. Chair, do we have any disclosures, Chair Jennings? Uh, Yes, okay. Disclosures of ex parte communications. Steve, anything? Uh, no. Other than the fact that you talked to the neighbors who were concerned about this yeah, as you just call. said. Uh, uh, David? I went to the site, spoke to the architect. I know Dean. He's our family vet. He called me as well. I learned nothing other than what was already in the report. Okay. John? Uh, I visited the site. I did not talk to the architect. Uh, I know Dean. Our dog's been there too many times. Um, but I didn't learn anything other than knowing what the site looks like. I'm familiar with the property. I don't have anything uh, beyond the uh, what was in the staff report. Um, familiar with the property. Used to live close by. Um, got a call from uh, Dean, but nothing other than that is in the agenda. And uh, you are Mr. Wertheimer. I am. Yes, I'm the architect for the project. <clears throat> Thank you for having us here. Uh, so it sounds like there's some continuing confusion about the two-thirds rule. And um, Commissioner Uring requested through um, our planner, Justine, for a <clears throat> different way of calculating the two-thirds rule from what we have been using since we started this project when we first met with uh, Richard Malika and um, subsequently uh, inherited or started working with Justine and what I've been working with in the 20 some odd years that I've been involved with projects in, in Malibu. And we, we tried to um, do a new calculation, or we did a new calculation um, uh, based on what Commissioner Uring was requesting and still fell within the two-thirds rule, uh, rule, even though, as I think this was discussed in the last hearing, this gross square footage isn't connected with single-family residences. It's related more to commercial projects or only to commercial projects, and more importantly, it's not the way that the two-thirds rule has ever been calculated in Malibu, and uh, to rethink or reconsider a project that has been being planned for a year based on rules that all of the city planners that we've met with um, have agreed upon, gone through our numbers in many, many iterations, um, is somewhat disturbing. And uh, we've worked really hard to comply with everything that's been asked of us. And we're within all of the guidelines. Um, and so I would love to clarify anything misunderstanding here so that we could actually move forward with this project. and. We, we got a glowing recommendation for approval based on all the work that we've been doing. We never received any calls from neighbors. Um, Justine never received any calls from concerned neighbors. That's uh, kind of a surprise to us that they just reached out to one commissioner. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Um, how long uh, would it take, or would, could, could this matter be brought back if it were to be brought back as a full CDP? Um, we would just have to complete the 21 day noticing required, so it would be approximately a month. Okay. Um, John? Um, I also would like when you come back to further explore the size versus the neighborhood. It appears only two houses are bigger in uh, 30, 38 houses you gave us. And also some discussion of the upside down two thirds rule. Um, are there anybody else? All right, did I get a motion? I'm not sure. Steve, was it your motion? To bring it back? Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second. A second, all right. Um, before we call the roll, I'm gonna oppose it for all of the reasons that you just said, uh, plus the fact that, that, that the, uh, the two-thirds rule, if it is an issue in this particular project, it, uh, is an issue that is, um, affects, as an aesthetic matter, properties that can't see it. So I, I'm not sure why, um, it, but my real reason is that, uh, again, um, we have to do something about the process where people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, and rely on rules and design according to rules that have been applied in a particular way and then come and find that the rules aren't going to be applied that way. It's just, it's beyond, it's beyond Kafkaesque. But um, let's take a vote. May I just say I feel exactly the same way. Okay. Kathleen. Commissioner Uring. Yes. Commissioner Marks. Yes. Commissioner Weil. No. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Chair Jennings? No. Motion carries. Okay. See you in a month. That's uh includes three B where am I? Three B two. What's that one we called? And we've got three B three done and now we're up to <laughs> only seven thirty and we're out of the consent calendar. Um 4B is where we are now. This is the project coastal development permit 19-074. And it's a project at 29208 Cliffside Drive. It was uh, before us um, last meeting and is now returning. Uh, can we have a staff report, please? Yes, good evening, Chair Jennings and members of the Planning Commission. The project before you this evening is CDP uh, 1947. Uh, as described in the staff report, normally the scope of work proposed would qualify for an administrative plan review uh, rather than a CDP. However, due to a deed restriction required by the California Coastal Commission as a condition of approval for the original permit for the house, um, additions and development proposed after the approval of that permit require CDP, which is why we're uh, before you tonight. Therefore, the proposed work must be processed as a regular CDP um, and, uh, there is, uh, I'll get to two in a second. There was also code enforcement issues, um, that required, uh, further the CDP to come before you. The project site is located adjacent to Point Doom State Beach. However, the site does not contain, uh, any map trails, um, on or adjacent to it. Um, there is a small amount of, Esha on the property um, coming from the park just to the west um, that, that is unaffected by any of the proposed work. Um, and none of the proposed work would expand the existing fuel modification area. Um, to give some history about this project and that code enforcement that I mentioned before, um, in 1996, the Coastal Commission granted uh, the per a permit for the construction of the house that is now existing um, with associated development. Um, and the city approved the same uh, design in 1997, um, including removal of the ficus trees uh, that are again part of this project to be removed. Um, in 2005, the Coastal Commission issued a notice of violation for failure to remove those ficus trees, um, an unpermitted detached accessory structure 
a uh, swimming pool constructed a little bit farther seaward than the approved location um, and other unpermitted improvements located between the residence and the bluff edge. Uh, the subject CDP was submitted to address all of the remaining code enforcement violations and to propose a new swimming pool, trellis, landscaping, and hardscaping, which I'll get into more detail in a minute. Um, there is no increase in total development square footage um, and all development is proposed landward of the existing residence except for a very small uh, concrete patio connected to the rear of the house, um, some subsurface draining or drainage rather um, and uh, some that demolition. Uh, upon final inspection and approval uh, of this CDP, um, the code enforcement cases will be referred to the Coastal Commission for closure. And you can see in this image uh, that pool is located uh, on the right hand side of the screen on the seaward side uh, that will be demolished um, as well as uh, some very small stairs that you can't see here. Um, and the pool will be relocated um, to the street side of the house. Uh, the proposed work, again, includes the demolition of that pool, um, ficus trees on the streets uh, along PCH, um, construction of a new pool and pool equipment, uh, a new pergola, a new barbecue area and hardscaping, um, permeable hardscaping, an outdoor terraced seating area, um, new retaining walls, landscaping, some grading um, for those that hardscape work. Um, and after the fact, uh, permit for some, the concrete pool equipment pad on the bluff side, um, removal of those stairs that I mentioned before, and a very small uh, stacked wall along the top of the bluff. Um, this application also includes demolition permit uh, 1944 for the demolition of uh, the items related to code enforcement. This is just showing the current state of the front yard where that new pool and all the hardscaping is to be um, developed. Um, we recommend approval of this application and I, and I believe the applicant um, are available for questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, ex parte communication disclosures. Nothing beyond uh, disclosed last time. Sorry? Nothing beyond what was disclosed last time. Okay, uh, Steve? Uh, I visited the site with John, met with the, uh, with, with Jamie, took us through the project, didn't learn anything that wasn't in the staff report. David? Same, visited the site, met with Jamie. Nothing beyond the staff report. Okay, John? Absolutely same, I visited with Steve, talked to Jamie, uh, and nothing, didn't learn anything. Nothing, Jamie didn't call me. <laughs> um, all right. If, uh, it does, are there any questions of staff about this project, or can we move right to the to the uh, hearing? Short question. One question, John. Um, was the solid gate in the front, the eight foot gate or six foot gate, was that approved in the original C CDP? A non permeable gate. Right. I did. I did not see that um, as part of the original approval, um, and I believe that's included in one of the conditions to replace that gate with something legal. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, who's going to speak? Jamie, I've got your applicant team here. Um, I'm sorry? you got to get up to the microphone so I can hear you. My name is Jamie Harnish. I represent the applicant, Tamara Limited. Um, I am here with the project architect, Ann. I'm also here with the project landscape architect, um, Judy. Um, I would like to thank David Weil, our new planning commissioner, for coming to see me at the site today um, with limited notice. Uh, that was great. I also apologize to um, Chair Jeffrey Jennings. I do send you emails. I must not have your correct email, so I need to correct that. Because I do like to meet each and one or every one of you at the site, just so you can see it for yourselves. Uh, we are basically here to answer any questions you may have. Otherwise, I don't believe a presentation is necessary. Okay. John. Well, uh, this is really to Justine and then the landscape architect could answer it. Um, on, on plan number L1.02, uh, the, the property line on the side of the park is proposing to put in uh, 10 to 12 foot 
uh, wax myrtles uh, that are six to eight foot apart, or six to eight foot wide. So it is a hedge, um, and it exceeds the six foot limit. So I wondered uh, why we shouldn't require a, tr a, a plant that doesn't grow more than six feet. Now, believe me, I had to get out my microscope to read it, but it's there. It's uh, perhaps a landscape, if we have the landscape architect, maybe you'd like to come to the podium. Hi, thank you, um, commissioners. Um, Your name is? My name is Judy Camion. I'm a landscape designer and contractor for the project. And um, we were followed closely the approved plant list for the Santa Monica Mountains and in the shrub category, the Myrica Californica, which is uh, one of the native shrubs that is recommended for the area. Um, we selected that as that um, perimeter planting. Uh, Myrica is known to be very adaptable and is uh, one of its characteristics is that it can be easily maintained at a much smaller size, which is the intention, um, as well because the clients uh, want to observe the, um, the height limitation, as well as have something that's n n nice and neat looking. And as with many of the native shrubs, a lot of them are very scrubby, and this is aesthetically the best choice for the project as well as being climate appropriate and, and you know, uh, appropriate for the site conditions and the, um, you know, uh, need for natives. David. Uh, I guess it's a staff question. Can't we uh, uh, require that whatever the plant is be maintained at six feet? Um, I think the, the issue is whether it's, um, grows together as a hedge. Um, plants that are taller than six feet are allowed in a side yard. Um, it's a hedge that has to be maintained at six feet. So I guess my question is, um, is the intention to maintain these as individual separate plants or um, have them grow together as a hedge? Um, that's a great question. The, the um, kind of aesthetic of the project is quite informal in keeping with the spirit of, of Malibu and the Santa Monica Mountains. So we're not looking to replace what we previously had there, which was the non-conforming clipped ficus hedge, which was very formal and more of a kind of a Beverly Hills aesthetic than more of the feeling and flavor of Malibu. So it'll be kept loose and soft. It's not, not the idea is not to have some kind of formal topiary um, you know, um, look, but to keep it uh, soft and loose as, you know, so that it really kind of um, is, a, you know, relevant to the, the greater landscape, which is what we're connecting to in the design. Will the spacing um, accommodate that with, uh, if it grows, if they grow, are they going to be far enough apart that they stay individual? then you think, or are you going to keep it trimmed to a particular size so that it doesn't grow together? The instructions, or, uh, so we provide instructions for maintenance um, at the um, completion of all of our projects, and our instruction will be to maintain a natural form. Um, uh, the spacing is, I would say it's moderate. Um, it's not super tight, it's not super broad, um, you know, the client, had great screening and privacy there, and given that they're next to a public space, we're trying to both find the right balance of, of restoring some semblance of privacy for them at the same time as adhering to the, the code. Of course. Given the fact that they grow eight feet wide, um, are you specifying uh, a planning distance greater than that? Greater than eight feet? Yeah. Spacing them further than eight feet apart? Yes. No, we're not. So you're essentially going to have a hedge? It will be a very, yeah, it's an informal, it'll be a, an informal, it's basically the shrubs that are part of it, an informal border. Okay. Um, so if it if it if that's the case, then it would need to be maintained at, um, at a height of no more than six feet. Understood. And then uh, condition 31 basically specifies that. So it is in the resolution on page 10. 
Um, so that should take care of that. Uh, since we have a prior violation on that, do we, can we make that stronger? You can specify the specific location if you want to. Okay, I'd like to do that. What so, do you mean specify? Um, vegetation form of, of EU and permeable conditions serving the same function as a fence or wall located within the side or rear yard setback shall be maintained at or, at or below a height of six feet. And you can say in specifically including, um, what, how would you describe this area? Was it the south property line? Is that the property line adjacent to the park. That just, makes it, that just makes it looser on the other side, so there's no real reason to do it. You say you got to have it six feet at one side, which kind of indicates well, you don't care about the other side. It already other, clears, the, clears the side and rear yard setback, so it's just if you want to have more specific. And there specific. is language in the condition about um, if there are more than three violations of the condition, then the vegetation would have to be removed. So that's, we have, you know, more in more recent years, added that to these um, conditions so that we have a recourse to, you know, solve that problem. If it is, continues. is that in this condition? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. I've got a question, Justine. Uh, this is within 100 feet. I assume that the swimming pool is considered development. And there's part of the LCP that says you can't develop within 100, I think it's 100 feet, maybe it's 100 and a quarter from a park. So do we, because this is obviously not possible, do we need a variance? We don't need a variance because, and I gotta refresh my memory, we were saying because it's included in the existing development area, it's not exacerbating an existing um, encroachment, so it's, it would be, a variance for something that's already existing? Does that, does that make sense? Well, my, my only question on that is that we're making them remove the pool because it was uh, a violation. The pool, the pool was a violation of being too, uh, too close to the bluff edge. Well, it never got a permit either, right? It did. It was permitted as part of the original CDP. They just, uh, when they constructed it, they constructed it cl too close to the bluff edge. But it was part of the original approval from the Coastal Commission. Okay, well, this is a question, Trevor. I don't mind giving a variance, but should we? No. We do on other properties. We, we, we can't. They're within 125 feet. We can't give a variance uh, without agendizing the matter. We can't just say, okay, we're going to treat this as a variance. If you need a variance, it would have to be re-noticed if it's not noticed for a variance. What was the need for the variance? It's within 100 feet of a park. But the, but the purpose of that is that it... Um, if there's fuel modification associated with it, that would affect the park. So that really doesn't, that's not really an applicable, that wouldn't serve any purpose. The fuel modification has been subject to a prior variance then? It's an existing situation. The, I mean, the it, house was permitted in that location. The pool doesn't require fuel modification. So where it is on the property really doesn't um, affect Park. Well, my question would be, the house obviously does not predate the park. So at any time was the variance given? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I mean, the Coastal Commission originally permitted the house, and I don't believe they process variances. Okay, if Trevor didn't think we have to, I will insist on it. You all set then, John? What? You all set? Yeah. I'll move the staff recommendation. What, well, uh, uh, we had a change. Commissioner, Commissioner Maza, one suggestion to uh, condition 31 you were looking at. I'd suggest you remove the word sequential and just say three violations of this condition will result in a requirement to permanently remove the vegetation from the site just to make it clear. It's unclear what sequential would mean. Yeah, that's, that's fine with me. Wasn't there something we were going to add? Well, we weren't going to add anything about the, the hedge. That was it. That was it. So it's not as staff recommends. It's a change. He wants to remove sequential and... Okay. Why don't you make the motion, John? Uh, I'll make the motion removing the word sequential. Okay, Does that, that do it? Hold on just a second. Okay, hold on just a second. Trevor, you got the record right? So we, it's staff's recommendation with the uh, deletion of the word sequential from the last sentence of condition 31. Was there any other changes? That's, no? that's the only one I have. Moved and seconded. 
Please call the roll. Well, is there further discussion? I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Before we do that, is there anybody else in the audience who wants to address this project? Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. Now we're back here. We've got a motion. It's seconded. Please. And to be clear, you guys don't need this one brought back. I'm sorry? Just with that one change. No. 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 Please call the roll. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Uring? Yes. Commissioner Marks? Yes. Commissioner Weil? Yes. Chair Jennings? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that was We're now at um, 5A. 5A. 5A is the Coastal Development Permit 20-010. This is to implement a parking management plan through uh, regulatory signage with staggered overnight parking limitations on both sides of Pacific Coast Highway in the Las Tunas Beach area. Staff report. Good evening, Chair and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, as you mentioned, this project is the first step in the city's um, actions towards working with a way to mitigate some of the issues we've been faced with along Pacific Coast Highway with overnight parking. This particular coastal development permit will focus on the open area that is located around the Las Tunas area. This is on our eastern end of the city. To the top of the screen here, you have just a general vicinity map. Of you, the little blue dot there towards the right is Topanga Beach, and then Big Rock is to the left to give a reference of where we are. This is a bit more detailed diagram. The red lines here demonstrate the boundaries of the project. Roughly, it's from the once you pass Tuna Canyon, uh, heading towards the Ventura end of the city. It's where the houses stop. That's the lower picture that you see there with the red line. Moving towards the west till you get to the first house. It's roughly in the Caltrans view area. This particular project will propose the installation of signage along a third of a mile of Pacific Coast Highway. The application will allow for the installation of signs as well as the poles for those signs. The parking prohibition would be staggered and the reason for this is to address the concern of public beach access. This type of design will allow for access to the beach for 24 hours a day. However, you do have to move your vehicle uh, for a two hour window as you can see. The first part of this will take place on the land side of Pacific Coast Highway from 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. While that side is closed, the seaward side of PCH for parking would be open and then it would switch at 2 a.m. This mirrors the um, application that was recently approved by the Coastal Commission on Appeal for the Topanga Beach area that the county pursued. And what we're doing with this type of staggered parking is we're working to address the issues of public access from the uh, city's LCP as well as the state's Coastal Act. And in our staff report, we address the specific sections of the Coastal Act that we were addressing. Also, this will result in greater parking availability because it does force the turnover of parking. So it would eliminate the long-term parking or storage of vehicles. And also we would, as we discussed in the staff report, also have an impact on public views. Uh, right now you have both uh, private and commercial oversized vehicles that are being stored on the highway, which do block views of the ocean as well as take up large amounts of parking. And this would force those to be turned over and not stored. Part of this is also a public health issue. On February 2nd through the 5th, we had to do a closure in this area for cleanup. Um, what was brought to the attention of Caltrans and the city was discharges of trash and human waste. There was evidence of trash and waste, not only within the, the right of way of the highway, but also on the rocks making its way towards the ocean, actually in the ocean. So these long-term parking we're finding is having an environmental impact on our coastal resources. Uh, so you have the just degradation and then also pollution into our coastal resources and access. 
But once again, we did have to have a closure. We posted no parking signs, had to get all the vehicles out of there, and Caltrans came and cleaned up that mess. Because of concerns of this problem migrating its way up the coast, as I mentioned, this is just the first step in the city's project uh, to do this. The city council has already, as part of our ordinance for overnight parking limitations, approved a similar uh, ordinance for the Malibu Pier area. We'll be bringing that coastal development permit to the council in an upcoming meeting, or the commission, I should say. And going towards the council, we are gonna be going back to the city council to expand that ordinance from not only including this Las Tunas area at Malibu Pier, but also Corral Canyon Beach, Westward Beach, and Zuma Beach. Some of the concerns were raised at the Coastal Commission appeal hearing when this was addressed by the county was alternatives uh, for those who are uh, homeless or would be displaced by this. The city is partnering with the county to evaluate safe parking lots. That would be a parking lot where someone could move their vehicle um, at night, go to this parking lot. There would be services there, uh, security, restroom facilities, place for trash and waste. And currently the city is working with the county to look at options at the Will Rogers State Beach parking lot, Zuma Beach parking lot, and there's also discussions of looking at the courthouse and making that also uh, an opportunity for shelter. So the city is working on trying to find alternative locations so that this problem doesn't end up just getting pushed up the highway. There would be a place for those who are displaced um, and are looking to find services and move on. Staff did receive a comment letter from the Coastal Commission that should have been distributed to all of the commissioners. Essentially, in that comment letter, the Coastal Commission uh, is looking for us to establish these parking lots prior to approval of this coastal development permit. However, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission adopt Resolution 2032 to approve the coastal development permit so that these signs could be installed in the Las Tunas Beach area. I'm available for any questions if there are any. Okay, the applicant is the city, right? Yes. Okay. Um, ex party communication disclosures, Chris? None here. Steve? We've been down the beach and seen the cars there. David? Same. John? I've driven by there at least 12,000 times. <laughs> um, I did have a conversation with Richard today uh, about this item, but other than that, it's nothing that's not in the staff report. Um, Okay, I think we just opened the public hearing on this. Is there anybody who wishes to address the commission uh, on this item? Okay. Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. We're back at the commission table. Who would like to go first? Steve. Two questions, Richard. The Caltrans cleanup on the beach, do we have details of what they found, what they cleaned up? I mean, a good description of the, I mean, you know, this is going to, we're going to go up against somebody at some point in time. And you know, the fact that we've got all this stuff, you know, the feces and everything else on the beach, we should just make sure that everybody's aware of that because that's part of the reason why we're doing this. And that's a health issue. That's, you know, an issue for people coming to the beach, trying to get there. I mean, I don't see any of the coastal commissioners bringing their kids or their grandkids to the beach to play in the sand. Uh, so we ought to just make sure we understand what that is. Our, oh, sorry, our environmental services department has pictures of what was cleaned up, so there is a record in the city, yes. Okay. Uh, second thing, when they did the signs at, uh, where was it, Topanga, uh, did they make them put in safe parking locations? My understanding is that it was approved with the county working on such a plan. Okay, gotcha. Does this go to the city council after us, or is it, do we... we mm -hmm. Finalize this. No, your decision would well, be final unless it unless it is appealed. Okay, I just I want to do this. I mean, right. I think we've got to start making a stand, and this is one way to do that. Right. That's yeah. It. There's video documentation of of waste from 
uh, vehicles being right. emptied and dumped into the ocean. Um, it's and the and the city council has made it very clear that that they are very concerned about the problems and the um, issues around people experiencing homelessness, and they have um, directed staff to work on a number of different programs. Um, the, there's actually a walkthrough that is planned <coughs> with the county um, later this month of the courthouse to um, see if that would be a viable location for a shelter. Um, and there are safe parking um, programs, you know, mm -hmm. that the yeah. city's working with yeah. the county on for Zuma and um, Will Rogers that Richard mentioned. Um, this is, it's, it's a complex problem, but this is a, a, a side effect of it that we're, that, you know, it's affecting coastal access, it's affecting public health, and so it's, you know, yeah. no, I'm, we've got to all... start somewhere. I'm in favor. You get it. David? Thank you, I, I'm in favor as well. I, it, it seems to me, obviously, that this is an immediate and serious health and safety issue, and I, I mean, it's, it's a slam dunk. Having said that, um, you know, working on the safe parking program is a fairly open-ended concept. I, I don't know that we as a planning commission have the authority to do anything about it, but, um, you know, is it possible to consider saying that we will come back with a program no later than X period of time or trying to put some limitation on it because leaving it open-ended really does simply move the problem along uh, sort of into a distant future with no end to it. And I think we are, you know, we have a responsibility to try to do something about the problem, not just move them along. Chris? Yeah. First off, there was something written up in the um, – in the report about trying to get access to uh, Southern Cal so SoCal Edison polls. Any updates on that? Is that going to help us kind of minimize? No, not yet. Our public works department hasn't received confirmation yet if we can utilize those as uh, posting locations. Okay, so we should assume all the polls will go in that are listed in the plan. Um, and then otherwise, um, just kind of playing on where Commissioner Yearing started and, and kind of where con conversation has gone so far. Um, as things move up the coast, you know, right now Coastal gave um, the Topanga change that was allowed to go ahead with them just saying we're going to plan a new parking. Now they're asking us to actually have parking. I'm, I'm getting that that um, scrutiny will get harder and harder as, you know, things get all the way through the city. Do we have a plan to put in front of Coastal something that would address that as we go, you know, if that makes sense. So as we're getting to the third, fourth, fifth location, we're implementing these rules, that we have a more formal parking plan, or will that just kind of form ad hoc as we go? Any expectations there? Um, well, because these issues are kind of um, inter intertwined, as, as soon as we have um, more firm details about how the safe parking programs will uh, roll out, we will get, you know, combine that information into these um, staff reports and we'll yeah. certainly keep the Coastal Commission posted on, on that progress. The, okay. The city's homeless mits, this uh, programs are a separate track and there was a separate special meeting on that and there's also been, in, uh, the city's also uh, moving to join the governor's 100 day program. So there will be probably accelerated action be taken on that, but they're not linked to this period of time, but this has been brought forward because of the immediate need and the, um, the problems that are developing in this particular site. So as quickly as those other items can move, the city is moving them and um, that information will get out there. If there is an appeal, hopefully it would, um, there'd be more information to be provided to the commission by the time it gets there. I don't, um, I don't, doubt the immediate need, um, but I, I just wonder whether this has been completely thought through. You're, you're going to have uh, no parking between 12 and 2 on the landward side and between 2 and 4 on the beach side. So I'm sitting in my RV on the beach side and it comes 12 o'clock so all of the people on the landward side have got to move. They, they start up and they go away, leaving a bunch of parking places over there. And then at 2 o'clock, um, I've got to move, so I start mine, all of us in the caravan, we all start our RVs, 
and we make a mass choreographed U-turn across Pacific Coast Highway at 2 in the morning until 4 in the morning, at which time we make a mass choreographed U-turn across Pacific Coast Highway back onto the ocean side. Doesn't seem to me like the health and safety issues have been entirely thought through uh, in, in, in this program. Or we traded one for another. I'm sorry? We may have traded one issue for another. It, it just seems to me that there might be a better way to do it. And plus, beyond that, though, as far as I'm concerned, um, I, you know, I, this business of playing whack-a-mole with, with uh, the people who are parked on the beach. First of all, uh, I've got a, a trailer myself, and it's been through a few years, and it's, it's beginning to look like maybe it would fit in appropriately down there at, at that spot. And, and, and I'm not sure why people should be rousted out every 24 hours to go find a new place to park. It seems to me that we, if we want to put together a program that's going to allow maximum beach access, that you might be able to, to allow people to stay for two or three or days or whatever. I don't know, the black water tank in my trailer can hold, um, it doesn't have to be dumped until every two weeks. So it just seems to me that there might be other ways to approach this thing, apart from the obvious traffic danger that we're going to be creating. John. Well, I think what we're, speaking to what you're talking about, I think what we're talking about is instead of getting up at 2 in the morning and driving to the other side of the street, you're going to park on Malva Road or uh, some other place in town. Now, because why get up at 2 in the morning every morning? And so we're pushing, I agree we have to work on this, but we're pushing this off to other neighborhoods. Maybe they're not on the beach. Maybe we can get Zuma Beach. Maybe we can get at least uh, by, by the, Santa Ma, the seafood restaurant. Maybe we can get those protected. When you're talking about Zuma Beach, you don't have as much trouble because when you dump your tanks, they don't run right in the ocean. Uh, but the real thing is the long-term plan of getting it, most of it done. So you're, at least if people are parking, they're parking not next to waterways. Um, and there's reports on Facebook this week about people dumping right into the ocean. Um, so I don't have any problem with this, but I wonder why and I don't know why the lawyers haven't commented on this, but what we're doing is passing something and say, but gee, we're going to fix it in the future with this homeless thing, which is amorphous and has nothing to do with this, really. It, it, so we're promising something that may never happen because it hasn't even been agendized. So we may be pushing the Coastal Commission to saying, okay, you can do it for six months. Now, my real question, and this is maybe Richard can answer it, I drive to Oxnard every once in a while. I went up there about a month ago. There are at least 400 no parking signs that are recently installed, at least 400, every 150 feet, all the way from county line to Oxnard, practically. Now, who approved those? And I don't remember hearing anything about it, but they're on both sides of the street all the way up. Um, and is that just because they're, they're more favored than Malibu because Malibu has a bad reputation or whatever? But I, I'd like to approach this somewhat on who are we pushing these people off onto? Because the rest of town is not happy, at least part of town is not happy about what's going on at uh, Corral Beach. Um, really not happy. And so we have to, I think we have to approach this with the Coastal Commission is we're not promising anything in the future. We want to solve this now, this problem. Part of that is we had lost $6 million to the NRDC for polluting the ocean. And we have a consent decree with the NRDC that we won't. And we're required not to. That's not mentioned in here. Well, <clears throat> there they can come in and say, "You guys are dumping sewage in the ocean." What we're supposed to be doing is determining whether or not the plan, as presented by staff, is does or does not com uh, comply with the Coastal Act. That's that's the issue before us. I mean, yeah. Right, and that's why I'm are saying, you? why are we bringing all this extraneous stuff up no. about well, we're going to solve the problems of the world? Well, there's a good reason for that because we've been trying to coordinate closely with the Coastal Commission on 
um, a solution to this problem. And their recommendation was that the city um, follow the same approach that the county negotiated with the Coastal Commission and um, was approved during that appeal hearing in October. And the Coastal Commission staff expressed that they would like to have consistency among um, jurisdictions. And so it's on their advice that we have taken this approach. It's not perfect. Um, I completely agree with that. But it's, it's, it's an approach that it tries to balance um, coastal access by having, the park, having parking in a particular area available all the time um, and also, you know, pairing that with um, the social justice, if you want to call it that, or issues around people who don't have anywhere else to go and are living in their vehicles. Um, the, the coastal commissioners themselves expressed great concern about that. And so um, obviously our city council has also expressed great concern about that. So this is, this is the way that uh, we were advised to approach the matter. Uh, my question is the county is really big. We're really small and we're mostly hills. So we have a very limited area to park. And did the county agree to put it near the, the this parking near the beach? Or could they put it in Downey? Or unincorporated Downey or something? That's where I'm trying to get an idea of what, what they're agreeing to and what we're agreeing to. Well, the, the city manager's working closely with um, the county on these safe parking program ideas. The, this part of the city is, is nearest the, um, the city, the county's um, eastern border, or the city's eastern border is nearest the county, and you know they're already working on other programs, but the, this, this effort that's going on now about looking at Will Rogers State Beach and um, Zuma as potential locations, um, that's, that's underway, and um, you know they're, they're working as quickly as they can to, to do that. I don't know where else in the county they're looking at it. Um, so that's, that's what I can tell you about well, that. Okay. Can I ask Trevor a question? Trevor, uh, on, on our NRDC settlement, to me this appears to violate it. So are we, are we covered why, on why that? Would, why would it violate it? Because we were prohibited from dumping anything in the ocean, this, anything. The city is not dumping anything. We're this allowing is, it to happen. This is attempting to, per, to remove a source of the contamination. I mean, that's the city's effort here is to prevent uh, vehicles that are doing this from camping there overnight. So the city had a, a previous CDP that it brought forward and, and was rejected by the Coastal Commission in terms of um, prohibiting parking along PCH. So this is the effort the city is, is making to do this the best it can. I mean, um, it wouldn't violate the agreement by us seeking to take what, what, what ability it can to pre to prevent uh, further contamination in the area. Okay, so, uh, yeah, David? Just quickly responding to your earlier point, uh, my understanding is that the program south of, of uh, Topanga um, has been successful, and rather than having people turn around at 2 in the morning, well, if you, if you regard moving them up the coast as successful, <laughs> they have moved out of there, and that's what's going to keep happening. Every place we put up a sign, they're going to move further up and further up, which is why I think it's so critical that we do focus on whatever we can do with a safe parking program, because um, otherwise we're just sweeping this up into yeah. further. And, yeah. and that's absolutely the intention. And it doesn't really, I mean, if you think about it, it doesn't seem like it's all that elaborate a process. I mean, if you have a flat lot, you put some, some fencing around it, and you, and, you, and you could even make a dump site there with, with, with very little money. But in any event, we're, we're supposed to be deciding whether this is a violation of the Coastal Act or not, or, or I'm sorry, consistent well, with, the coastal, for the CDP uh, for with the Coastal Act. Um, and so is there anybody ready to make a motion on this? I'll move staff's recommendation. Is there a second? I second. Moved and seconded. Call a roll, please. <clears throat> Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Weil? Yes. Commissioner Marks? Yes. Commissioner Uring? Yes. Chair Jennings? Um, this is the first time I've ever agreed with a Coastal Commission letter. I'm going to vote no. <laughs> Motion carries. Uh, four to one. That's, uh, that takes care of uh, 5A. We're now at 5C. 
This is Coastal Development Permit 14-012 and Variance 14-002 and 003. This is a strange application to widen the segment of West Sea Level Drive uh, to take care of a long-standing access issue there. Now, just have a staff report, please. Yes, good evening, Chair uh, Jennings and members of the Planning Commission. Um, this version of the project has, uh, was first submitted in 2014. Uh, however, the project has been in the works since 2006. The application was scheduled for a hearing in 2015. At the time, the applicant requested a continuance to permit additional time to address private matters uh, with the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority which according to uh, the former applicant uh, have been uh, resolved since. The application involves the widening of, uh, 12, of a 12 foot wide segment of the road that connects Broad Beach Road to West Sea Level Drive. This segment of the road is mainly located on two private properties who have since granted access easements across their properties provided the improvements in, in this application are uh, constructed, including landscaping and an up to eight foot tall privacy wall to help uh, headlight um, intrusion as well as noise from uh, vehicles passing. Um, this next ex exhibit shows uh, in green the entirety of the project area. Uh, the majority of the area is the landscaped area. Um, however, the road improvements are also included within that area. Uh, the existing gate is located near the west end of the uh, project area, um, and the public right-of-way in this exhibit is the area just to the north of the yellow uh, boundary. Uh, the project uh, description includes, again, widening of the road, um, 101 cubic yards of non-exempt grading, a six-foot retaining wall along the northern boundary of the road widening, um, and also the fire department turnaround, uh, 2,500 square feet of landscaping, uh, bicycle racks, two entry code keypads. Uh, the project also includes two variances. Uh, one is for construction on slopes steeper than 2.5 to 1, and also for the privacy wall uh, up to 8 feet in height within the SAIAR setback. Uh, the grading plan um, shows the boundaries of the existing driveway in a blue uh, dashed line and the location of the new retaining wall uh, represented by the heavy black dash line on this uh, exhibit. The area in blue identifies the slopes are steeper than 2.5 to 1, and these are uh, the variant slopes. Um, uh, the slope is the area between the existing uh, road and PCH. Uh, the proposed driveway, excuse me, the proposed road will extend into the slope to widen, to widen the road to uh, construct a six foot retaining wall on the edge of the road. Uh, the retaining wall will help minimize any additional uh, extension or projection into the steep slope uh, just to the north while providing a relatively flat area uh, for the road as well as for a fire department turnaround uh, towards uh, uh, or near the, the gate. The proposed project uh, would provide a fire department compliant road access for existing development on West Sea Level Drive and uh, the five undeveloped lots that are on uh, the same road, as well as provide access to 88 visitors um, that um, may want to visit Lechuza Beach just uh, at the end of that road. Um, staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt uh, resolution number 20-22, uh, approving the proposed project as conditioned, and uh, the applicant and staff is available for any questions. 
Thank you very much. Um, ex parte communication disclosure, Steve? Uh, yes, I visited the site with John, uh, walked down the road. We also got a chance to walk down to the beach and see what the MRCA is planning to do down there. And that wasn't in the staff report, so I got a little more information than. David? I visited the site and just walked around. John? Uh, same disclosure, Steve. Commissioner Yearing, was uh, there any. Was one there, more. Uh, uh, Go ahead. I was going to say, was there anything you learned that would affect this project? Or the MRCA is supposed to come back to us for a, a, a permit, so we just got a, a preview of what they're thinking of doing. Okay. Uh, I want to add, I was at, I was on the uh, planning commission for the 2013 hearing. Uh, I'm familiar with that. I used to park there pretty often and walk from there down to the beach. Um, the one thing I'd observe is that. Mm, traffic coming off PCH there onto Broad Beach Road can come in pretty fast. So just if we're going to widen that area and it does increase the amount of traffic coming in there, therefore the number of people parking, I would just be a little concerned about the width of the shoulder because getting in your out of your car there with cars coming off the freeway, it's just a you know you know recipe for trouble. Um, that's the one observation I learned beyond the staff report. Okay, no disclosures for me. Um, let's open the public hearing. We've got. Um, Alan Abschuss, there he is. Good evening, Chairman <clears throat> Jennings and members of the commission. Um, Alan Abschuss, representing the MHOA, the Homeowners Association, Malibu National Homeowners Association. Um, this project is, uh, I think, I want to thank Mr. Fernandez for his presentation. Uh, it's a project that's going to rectify a substandard condition. It's going to enable better fire access by widening the, uh, this is actually a driveway now, a driveway over a private property to uh, the, to the width required by the fire department and add a fire department turnaround. It's also, so it's necessary for several purposes. One, to satisfy fire department requirements. It's going to enhance public access. <clears throat> the MRCA is going to con construct an ADA parking space at the end of West Sea Level Drive. In order to construct that, the fire department's requiring that they have this width access. Of course, it also serves the existing residents and enhances their fire safety by enabling uh, a, a roadway that satisfies fire department requirements. Um, it's minimally intrusive. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't create any growth inducement. There are five lot, undeveloped lots that are, were cut in 1932 and included in the city's general plan and, and uh, LCP. Glad to answer any questions you may have. Okay, we have other speakers, and I'll, we'll, if people want to call you up, they will. Norm Haney. Good evening again, uh, Commissioners, Norm Haney. Um, I worked on this project uh, starting about eight years ago, uh, up until two and a half years ago, three years ago. <clears throat> I'm in complete favor of the project. It is a um, solution and a resolution to um, a situation which is unsafe right now. Um, it uh, provides the proper fire department access for at least seven, if not eight, existing homes. Um, some people say that it, it's necessary for two or three additional homes to be built. That's true. But uh, it's necessary for the safety of the existing homes as well. The reason that it's being brought before you is because way back when, in 1932, when the track map was originally approved for this project, not this project, but for the original access off Broad Beach Road, <clears throat> the Ringe family didn't build it properly. They didn't make the connection up to Broad Beach Road. And as a consequence, homes were constructed and driveways were constructed based upon a hall road. This is merely an extension of what used to be a hall road to move dirt in order to create the pads <clears throat> uh, on this portion of West Sea Level Drive. Notwithstanding all that, the original plan for West Sea Level Drive to um, go on to Broad Beach Road cannot be done now. It's impossible. I've studied it. You can't do it without wiping out other people's driveways. So this is the only reasonable solution to a situation that's existed for many years, these people have been in risk, at risk for many years, like 40, 50 years. 
and this is a good solution. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience who wishes to address the commission on this project? Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. We're back at the planning commission table for comments, questions, maybe a motion. John? Uh, Adrian, in, in the, the uh, color-coded slope analysis map, you show a county storm drain, and the wall goes right over the top of it. Is that part of this project? Is that approved by the county, or what needs to be done about that? Because it's fairly close to the surface, like, So um, the right-of-way there is the city right-of-way. So it would be the city's responsibility to maintain that storm drain outlet. Um, can they give a, can, have they looked at whether or not you can build a wall on top of it? Because it's a fairly, fairly big storm drain. Drains the highway down into that stream. Or can there be a break in the wall? And then do we need to put a condition or something? Mr. Epschus? I think the plans show the installation of catch basin that, that will allow for that um, drainage to be undergrounded underneath the new, the new road alignment. So there won't be uh, an opening? Um, no, I think... You're going to have to lower the, the storm drain? Uh, well, I believe Public Works has re reviewed a plan that shows the catch basin being installed. On the, on the left-hand side of the highway as you go down? The, the left-hand side of the road? As you go out. As you go out? As you go out. That's where it is. There is a catch basin there. Right. But, it's, it, but the road's being widened over that location, so it's being... So where is the new one going to be? Um, if you, you got to come forward, please, so we can get it on camera recording. My name is Bill Kiefer. I reside at 31885 West Sea Level Drive. Have you filled out a speaker slip? It doesn't look like you have. Could you I do have that not. before the in, before you leave today? Could yeah. you fill one out and give it to the My name state? is on the agenda. Uh, oh, the right, current, you're asking about the exposed drainage ditch. Well, yeah. not, the, not the ditch itself. The ditch is on, as you go down, the ditch is on the left. And so that okay, gets and abandoned. On the right, that is abandoned. And in the middle of the road, one of these plans, it shows a, I believe, a 24-inch subgrade pipe that goes underneath the new driveway. Done by with the Public Works Department's oversight. Okay, um, Richard, do we have to approve that? It's in the plan. Is this part of what we, Adrian? Is this part of what we're approving? Is it in here somewhere? Because I didn't see it. But I could have um, missed it. I'm still trying to find it, uh, to be honest with you. So um, are we talking about the, the sheet three of the precise grading plans um, shows <coughs> what looks to be a storm drain pipe that um, crosses the street, and then there's a, maybe a cash basin, but it looks like maybe a lot outlet uh, structure. Um, just at the intersection of the road winding uh, road and to West Sea Level Drive. <coughs> um, do we have those plans? See that line right there? Mm -hmm. That's all underground. Oh, okay. This uh, the existing ditch. Like it's attached it to. Oh, we don't have bases abandoned. Yeah, I, it new. looks like we did get so 11 by 17. So this is new. So what page is it on? Okay. It's on sheet three of the grading plans that are yeah. included as attachment two to your staff report. Yeah, so um, sheet two, you say? Sheet three. Three. I don't have a sheet three. 
Oh. Sediment control plan, is that what I'm looking at? Sheet three of five. Oh, that's easy to read. <laughs> okay. So this apparently shows the, as you drive down the driveway, there's a major ditch. If you drove over it, you, you, you wouldn't get out. That's going to get filled in? Yes. Okay. And then there's going to be a pipe put underneath the, dri the driveway with a catch basin down at the bottom. Yes. And where does that water go? Because it's on the wrong side of the street to get to the, to get to the river. Isn't it? Is it in the middle of the street? Okay, so my question, Adrian, is they have it on this plan. I assume we're approving the grading plan, but this is a uh, not a grading plan. This is a, a uh, public work. Do we need to approve that, or is that going to be a separate application? So, so we're the, uh, talking about sheet three of the grading plans? Yeah, but if you, it's easier to see if you put up your color-coded slope analysis. You'll see that. So okay. the... These plans are available for anybody else who wants to see them. Just contact Kathleen. So I don't have any objection to a drain. I'm just wondering, can we, or do we need to approve that, or does it have to come back to the CDP? No, it, it's, it's part, part of, of the, the package of improvements that are associated with this road widening project. For the CDP for this project. Yes. So it actually you, says that in here because I've never found it, but it actually says it does. Because this is a grading. It's part plan. of the grading plan. Yes. Yeah, but you don't grade a pipe. Grading plans show infrastructure too. They show grading and drainage infrastructure. Okay. So this is this is not unusual. Okay. Now, question: Does the city pay for it, or do they? The, the applicant. The applicant is, is paying for all okay. the improvements. Okay. Gotcha. Doing this. Um, let's see here. Now, my major question is the MRCA's record on opening and closing gates, especially where you guys live, horrible. So, Trevor, do we have any way to find them or anything if the gate doesn't get opened or closed? Because public access. John, I think they got to come back to us before the MRCA yep. plan gets put in place. Yeah, the We're MRCA plan is separate from this plan, that. and I, I would be careful with any adjustments you're making here as it's part of a settlement. So you can ask the applicant if there's flexibility about um, any additional conditions you want to put about the gate that's included here. But oh, I, I don't worry about what they're building. I'm worried about if, if we approve this, they got a, a gate there that locks, and the MRCA is supposed to unlock it. Uh, we approve this, they build it, and then the MRCA does nothing. What do we do? So um, th this application does not include the gate. This is an existing gate. <clears throat> the MRCA is going to be coming to you with a separate CDP for the various Im improvements at Lechuza Beach they're proposing. And at that time, you're going to have a chance to review their beach management plan, uh, their improvement plan, uh, and you'll have a chance to appropriately, con appropriately condition it. We've been working with them for many years to, to reach an accord. We think we have it. Um, this is the infrastructure that, you know, it serves multi-purposes. One of them is to, it, it will provide the fire department requirements for the ADA, uh, for the ADA par parking space they want to build and for the viewing platform they'll have at the end of West Sea Level. And as Mr. Haney acknowledged, it, it also provides safe access for the existing homes and for the undeveloped lots. So you'll have a chance to, to address the MRCA when they come before you with their CDP. Does anybody open and close it now? Um, the, well, the gates open during daylight hours, so they, uh, the, there's, they have <clears throat> the, the, the MRCA currently has a vehicular access over West Sea Level Drive for, uh, for ADA purposes and for its service personnel. They didn't have an access over this driveway. It's a missing gap. 
um, we're going to facilitate an easement in favor of the MRCA just to make the connection over to Broad Beach Road. And then we're, uh, the Homeowner Association is going to improve the, the driveway, if you will, to provide legal fire department access and access for residents and the public. If I stood out there tomorrow morning at sunrise, would somebody from the MRCA come up and unlock it? Unlock the pedestrian gate. They would? Yep. And they have been doing it consistently? I think so. It's all automatic timers. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Anybody else? That Fancy nine foot, eight foot fence. Where does that go? That goes on. That goes ad ad adjacent to the existing home, so adjacent to the um, residence owned by Mr. Kiefer, and then it tapers down as you go back towards Broad Beach Road. And, um, so it's on. Road. It's basically on the same road that we're repairing. Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. I'm looking for a motion. Maybe I'll move the staff's recommendation. I'll second. Yep. Comment? No. No. Um, call the roll, please. Vice Chair Mazza. Yes. Commissioner Uring? Yes. Commissioner Marks? Yes. Commissioner Weil? Yes. Chair Jennings? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that concludes. Um, what about a 10 minute? Uh, That'd be wonderful. Okay, we're going to take 10 minutes. Um, be back at 841.
back in session. We're at agenda item 5D, which is the project located at 5924 Zumeriz Drive. Um, this is a uh, CDP with, uh, uh, with a variance and a site plan review. Staff report, please. Yes, good evening again. Um, the following item uh, was previously scheduled for a planning commission hearing, um, but prior to the hearing, uh, it was continued due to a noticing issue uh, and to permit the applicant additional time to revise the project plans. Uh, since then, the applicant has revised the project to eliminate two um, variances that were requested at that time. The project is located in the Ramirez Canyon uh, re residential neighborhood and takes access from Samiras Drive via a driveway on the uh, property's Flagstaff. Um, the existing dirt driveway and building pad were the subject of a code violation that was rectified with an after effect approval from the California Coastal Commission. As the existing driveway is not wide enough to accommodate the current fire department requirement of uh, 20 feet wide. A variance is uh, requested for construction on slopes steeper than two and a half to one. Uh, Zomeris Drive is a private street. Uh, a nearby residence table was included as an attachment to the agenda report. The table shows the habitable square footages um, of uh, surrounding properties within 500 feet of the subject property uh, based on the tax assessor uh, information. Uh, the table includes surrounding properties, a um, uh, handful of uh, uh, similar square footages to the proposed residents. Uh, not included on the table are other uh, larger single family residences on Zumira's Drive uh, that are uh, to the south of the parcel's 500-foot uh, radius. Uh, the project is for a 7,212-square-foot single-family residence uh, with a 2,094-square-foot subterranean garage on a rooftop deck, uh, swimming pool and spa, uh, on-site wastewater treatment system, and other associated development. As mentioned before, a variance is requested for construction of the driveway and the fire department turnaround on a few slivers of uh, steep slopes identified in the blue hatching in this exhibit. Uh, the driveway takes advantage of the existing dirt driveway but must be widened to comply with the fire department and therefore the requested variance uh, could not be avoided. The project site is not visible from a scenic area, a scenic road, or public viewing area as defined in the local uh, coastal program. A trail has been dedicated along Zamira's Drive, but it has not been improved yet. Uh, the house is two stories up to 28 feet in height for the proposed elevator, and the rest of the residence is 24 feet in height for a flat roof, uh, including the height of the guardrail, uh, that's 42 inches. Uh, the guardrail uh, is proposed to be of glass or transparent glass. Um, and again, uh, the overall height or the maximum height of the structure will remain at 24 feet uh, for the areas other than the elevator. Uh, this picture uh, to the left uh, was taken from Zamira's Drive, and uh, to the right is a close-up of the story pole, sp story poles representing the proposed residence through the chain link fence gate. Uh, only a small corner of the residence will be visible from the road. So since... Uh, Friday, we have received a number of emails uh, from so several of the residents uh, who are concerned um, concerned for this project. Um, some of the, uh, the some of the points made in the 
emails are errors in the staff report and attachments. Uh, and some of the concerns relate to the uh, rooftop deck uh, due to its privacy, light, and potential uh, noise. Uh, another concern is the total amount of grading as well as the size of the residence. Um, here's a summary of the public comments and a response from staff. Uh, the LCP zoning conformance table in the staff report incorrectly states 920 cubic yards of grading. Uh, the correct amount of non-exempt grading is actually 635 cubic yards. After the applicant uh, reduced the total amount of non-exempt grading, uh, the correct amount of grading is stated later in the LCP grading conformance table. Uh, stated before, the California Coastal Commission subsequently approved unpermitted grading. The after the fact approval predates the current 1,000 cubic yards uh, requirement, and therefore the proposed grading is not an aggregate to the previous approval. It should also be noted that the proposed amount of grading is almost uh, entirely attributed to the proposed driveway. Uh, the code exempts the fire department turnaround. The second page of the story poll uh, photographs include, uh, included as attachment five was inadvertently added to this project, but it relates to a completely different project. Uh, the project, the subject project does not have an empty pool or any other uh, development. Uh, the map was, the map with parcel numbers uh, included as attachment six. Uh, it's not related to the st story pool photographs. Uh, the map is uh, included as a request by the Planning Commission to show the property's 500 foot uh, for the purposes of um, uh, identifying the neighborhood uh, around the subject property. Uh, and it's not uh, to provide reference or be linked to the uh, story poll uh, photographs that were included as a separate attachment to uh, the staff report. The, the nearby residences within uh, 500 feet table includes attachment three, excludes the subject property. This has been discussed in previous planning commission meetings regarding other projects. Um, we provide the tax assessor data for surrounding properties because this is the information that's ready, readily available to staff. However, um, uh, the uh, habitable square footages for the subject property are not provided uh, since the code requires that they provide numbers related to total development square footage, which is uh, a slightly um, different calculation. Um, the residence total development square, square footage breakdown is uh, included in the staff report. Uh, the site plan review for the residence is to both accommodate a second floor and a rooftop deck as a 42 inch uh, rooftop deck railing um, is again transparent. Um, therefore, its uh, potential visual impacts uh, for the residents is uh, mainly a, you know, uh, as a result of the second floor and not so much uh, as a result of the rooftop deck. Uh, without a site plan review for height, the footprint uh, for the residents would be uh, slightly uh, bigger, uh, which would then expand into surrounding Asha and surrounding slopes, um, therefore uh, requiring the need for the um, you know additional variances, uh, as well as pursuant to the LCP uh, modifications to require development standards that are not related to Asha protection, such as setbacks, height limits, etc., should be permitted where necessary to avoid or minimize impacts to ESHA. And there's ESHA just to the north of the property. Uh, the subject, uh, the applicant actually revised the plants uh, and moved it 30 feet away from the ESHA in order for the fuel modification of proposed residents not to extend into the ESHA. After the staff report was uh, pu uh, published, the staff uncovered a notable uh, error in the staff report and resolution. The residence was uh, described as 7,759 square feet, 
Uh, instead, uh, the residence is 7,212 square feet. Uh, with the TDSF from the uh, subterranean garage, the project's total uh, development square footage is 7,759 square feet. The resolution should be revised to reflect uh, this change. Uh, staff believes the proposed project is, con is uh, in conformance with all applicable code requirements and with the incorporation of the previously stated revision to um, the resolution staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt resolution number 20-30 approving the proposed project as conditioned and staff and uh, the applicant are available for any questions. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Um, I don't have any speaker slips for the applicant. Are they down there? Is the applicant here? Okay, can you fill out a speaker slip? Okay. No. Uh, the, are you prepared to make your presentation now? Okay, fine. Um, just fill out a speaker slip before you leave and, and leave it with the secretary, please. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I did that before I was ready for to open the hearing. Oh, we have to do a couple, a little bit of business here. Have a seat for a second. Um, Disclosures. Uh, yes, I visited the, the site with Commissioner Marks, uh, met with uh, the applicant, walked the site, which I thought was uh, important. He gave us a perspective of not only the site there, but also the surrounding houses. Uh, and I spoke to, uh, well, that's it. Okay. David? I visited the site, walked along as well, spoke to the applicant. Um, Learned that's anything? It. No, but yes, I did. The applicant was a lineman on the USC football team in the 1980s, which is very impressive. <laughs> Jeff, just one other thing. I mean, what I, I, I did speak to Adrian, and Adrian, this is not, was not his project. I guess he picked it up from uh, Jessica. So some of the stuff that's missing was, was not his, Adrian. <laughs> Correct. John? I drove by, I couldn't get in, but I did talk to the applicant. Um, <clears throat> I also got a call from Rick Mullen, who asked me not to read his email, which I had not read yet, so I deleted it. Chris? I did a site visit with the applicant. Um, Let's see, I also learned and I wanted to confirm, um, are you the fourth planner on this one, Adrian, just in terms of kind of the, the process so far that you're aware of that was shared with me? I'm sorry, what was the question? Are, are you the fourth planner tied to this? The applicant had stated as such, I just wanted to confirm. Uh, I, I thought I was the third, but maybe I, don't, I am the fourth. Okay. Okay. Um, and then another quick question just on the site visit from what I learned. Um, visually. disclosures now. I know. I, okay. I'm getting a confirmation also, though. Okay. So visually, what I saw was the pad um, appeared to be the majority of the grading, but you just stated in your in your presentation that it was the drive. It, can you clarify that difference, or did I misperceive something there? So the grading that has uh, taken place on the property includes the grading for the driveway as well as for the building pad. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I lived across the street from the property for about 10 years um, and um, spoke briefly with the applicant, but uh, not, didn't learn anything that's not in the staff report. I do want to add one more disclosure. I live about 750 feet, I think, as a crow flies from the applicant. So I do drive down uh, the road. I will see the project pretty much every day. So uh, just want to call that out. Um, okay. Um, let's have your presentation. You have about 15 minutes. Good evening, uh, Planning Commission Chair, Planning uh, members, uh, senior staff of uh, planners and audience. I'm Hassan Izad, representing my family, uh, the homeowners, for the house to be built in uh, 5924 Zumir's Drive. I'll start by giving you a one-minute history of how we have arrived to this uh, point in project and tonight. 42 years ago, in 1978, we rented a house in, uh, from Mr. Cowan 
on uh, Zumir's Canyon and moved to Malibu. In 1982, uh, we moved to 5908 five, Zumir's Drive. And uh, we moved there two, just two weeks before the Dayton fire, which started burning from uh, uh, the other side of the Ventura Freeway and uh, burned all the way through Ramirez Canyon and went to uh, Paradise Cove. Two of our neighbors lost houses and uh, uh, structures in that, in that uh, fire, unfortunately. And we somehow survived and stayed there for 22 years. My children uh, went to school and grew up in, in Malibu. So in 1989, 31 years ago, uh, when the property next door became available, 5924 Zumir's Drive, we thought we would build a house over there and uh, keep the family together. We started the construction, <clears throat> but life happened. And the uh, project was put on shelf. We moved, however, uh, we always thought Malibu was our main house. That was our home. Four years ago, this, is, this, is, this was the history, that's all. Four years ago, in 1916, when we decided to come back to Malibu, uh, we started by taking a, doing a new survey of the project and, doing, and started by looking at to see what were the things that were possible to do what, is, what was feasible to do in Malibu based on the new, new code. So we did a slope analysis and a slope band that shows uh, up to uh, 30, 36,000 uh, square, uh, square feet of uh, area in this project is less than four to one. What, uh, what this project, uh, what this uh, table does not show is the fact that about 18,000 square feet of this 40, uh, 36,000 is uh, is basically flat. It's uh, eight to one, six to one, ten to one. So that's that's what we have uh, in the thing. We also needed to do another analysis, which was to see what's the 30 percent slope, and we did so by uh, creating this this plan. This plan shows that uh, the area uh, that the area that is white <coughs> is the area that is uh, uh, less than thirty percent. So, based on uh, this information and uh, and the th and uh, the knowledge that we had gained, we prepared a, a project. This uh, this project, we think meets all the requirements of the city of Malibu, and we hope that after this presentation you would feel the same. In this project there, are, in following this procedure, there are two, two areas of uh, 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 issues that uh, the city of Malibu takes uh, great uh, care to look at. One is the setback. In the setbacks, uh, we have meeting, we are meeting all setbacks and exceeding the amount of setbacks that are required for, for sidewalk and side yard and front yard and so on. And as to the impermeable areas, uh, we are about 50 to 60 percent of what is allowed <coughs> to have in, in terms of impermeable areas. Uh, the TDSF as calculated based on this project, uh, gives us a total uh, square foot allowed of uh, 8,940 square feet. <clears throat> it would have been nice to have all this information uh, uh, in 1916. We didn't. We it took us a long time. We went through, made some, uh, uh, made the plans, pre uh, presented it, asked for variances, and then came back and tried to work out the variances, not to have them, and so we have ended up with what we have. Uh, this is the uh, rendering of a home as, it's, uh, as it is, and it's a very simple home, straightforward, not, nothing extraordinary about it. <clears throat> 
what we did was to uh, try to create the um, design this plan. We, uh, um, uh, this is the actual floor area, the square footages that we are using. The first floor is 4,327, and the second floor was calculated to be exactly uh, two-thirds, which is 2,885. And, and so the total of this is 7,200 or so. And with 547 square feet <coughs> from, uh, the, uh, from the uh, uh, basement um, gives us a total of uh, 7,759 square feet. Um, one thing that we did was to try to put the entire house structure on the flat portion of the of the property so the whole building that uh, 4300 square feet of the footprint of the first floor is sitting on the flat portion of the of the building and there was a requirement for the fire department uh, to have access to the back of the house and so we created that by uh, cantilevering it from the building this way there was no structure that was put on areas that are uh, of slope. These were all on flat area. That's, one is supposed to show you the, the cantilevered portion that allows the fire department to have access from the backside. <coughs> as far as uh, the fire department is concerned, <coughs> when you look at the uh, area, the turnaround that fire department required to have, it's 64 feet wide, and it takes up almost the entire width of our, our project. But even, even so, if you pay attention to it, there you would see that it is in the area of less than 30% slope. And actually, if you calculate it, it's about a foot or two short of being four to one area. So the location of this project creates some special situations over here. This is the uh, Google map uh, uh, picture of the area. And I have shown the distances from, for the three uh, uh, neighbors that I have. Neighbor to the north, uh, I have a distance of 300 and Uh, 300 over 300 square feet to the north and uh, from the neighbor to the south approximately 100 and ne neighbor to the west about uh, 500. There is also a elevation difference of 90 feet with the, with the neighbor to the north, neighbor to the south about 40 feet. They are 40 feet below the, pri the pad and the neighbor to the west is approximately 60 feet <coughs> higher than the, the pad area that we are using. So there, there are a, this is a, by itself, it seems like, okay. Um, there are a few points to, uh, to pay attention to. Uh, fire department, with the fire department, we created a situation that uh, uh, would allow us to, uh, to have a fire hydrant on the property. Uh, fire department required a depth uh, width of 20 foot, and so we pre pre created that. But then the, the, there is a, um, as you can see over here, the fire department required, or we requested and they agreed, that they would, there would be a fire hydrant sitting at that location. This is an advantage, could be an advantage to us, and at the same time advantage to the neighbors uh, to the south uh, that we have. Uh, right now, the two yellow areas that you see on the, on the map shows you the, the locations of the fire department, of, of the fire hydrants. The third one is the location of the fire hydrant that we are planning on 
on, uh, on adding. Mr. Rizal, let me interrupt you for a second. You have a total of 15 minutes, but if you want to save some for rebuttal after you hear opposition, you can save uh, some time in order to respond to, to that the would, questions. That would be fine. So, well, you've got four, four minutes and 19 seconds left. So it's your choice. If you want to save that, you can save it, or you can go on and continue your presentation. If you use the 15 minutes now, you won't have any time for rebuttal. Okay. Why don't we, why don't we hang on to this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll save the rest of the time. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I've, I've, I've got only two slips here. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, then uh, Jenny Ball. Okay. Rick? Uh, no, she can't. You, but you can speak uh, your three minutes. You can't add to her time. But he's, he, That's, he's allowed to speak on this because it's, his property is located so he, um, within 500 feet, so he won't be able to decide on this when it, if it goes to the city council, but he's allowed to speak on it because his property is within. It affects his property. Yeah, same as when there's a book. If you remember when it, you had the property news. Am I on? You're on. Well, I was counseled by the uh, city attorney pretty much to stay in a narrow lane, so I'm not even going to talk about this at all. I'm just going to read my wife's statement because she had to leave, unfortunately, and my daughter's sick, so she asked me to leave her statement, read her statement. Um, but I, before I did that, I wanted to say thank you to all of you for all of your hard work. Welcome to the team, David. And I uh, really appreciate all the many years of service that all of you have done and to the hardworking staff. I really appreciate it. So this is my wife's statement. I am Jenny Ball. I've lived in Ramirez Canyon since 1963 on a driveway commonly referred to as Ball Road. I am here to comment on this project, which, in my opinion, doesn't take into consideration its impact on the rural character of our neighborhood or its closest neighbors. As someone who has lived here a long time, I can tell you what is special about Ramirez Canyon is the hawks, the owls, the fields, the rabbits, and the peaceful serenity. It seems to me that instead of minimizing the impact on the land, the applicant has absolutely maximized the amount they can build on their very small buildable pad. I guess that's their right, but it's important for us all to remember to preserve the rural character, especially where it still exists. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Sir, you're back up. I'm sorry? Yes, one of them was Jenny and one of them was Rick. Oh, okay. The maximum uh, TDSF for the project is uh, 8,940. What we are building is uh, 7,700 and, uh, and some. So we are not exceeding the amount. Uh, this is the amount of uh, square footage that we needed to, um, for the number of guests we get from various places to, that, uh, that will stay with us from time to time. And uh, I have lived in the area. I love the area. I've lived there since uh, for 40 years ago. I have a lot of... Uh, feeling for it, and uh, what we are doing is not going to hurt the owls and, uh, and other uh, animals that are in the area. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience who wishes to address the commission on this project? Mr. Smith. Thank you. Um, I've got to know uh, he and his wife uh, over a period of time. I've seen him around town and whatnot. Very nice family. It just seems like it's like everything that happens here, it takes so long to get things approved. And with the fact that we've had a lot of people leave the city and another planner and maybe a little bit different information, um, these folks have, are lifelong Malibu people as far as I can tell, except for a, a small period of time. Um, I'm hoping that you'll see that They've worked hard to make the changes necessary and, and make everybody happy. Obviously, they built this, designed it, so it just fits perfectly in the, in the flat area there in, in between the slopes. 
with the decks, the way it points, and, and all that hard work that goes with it. So uh, hopefully everything, uh, you, you'll see it that way. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Chair Jennings, if the uh, applicant wanted to respond to that, they still have some time left. Do you do have an opportunity to respond to that if you wish? Uh, is there anybody else who wishes to address the commission? Hearing none, we'll close. I did want to point one thing. You did have a few minutes left of your time. You were mid discussion. Did you want to finish your thought, or are you good to just call it done? Well, you you have you have three you, you have three more minutes to, if you wish to speak. Yeah, on. if you want to use. Just them. wanted to point out uh, one more thing, which would be advantageous. This is the uh, the the project is being built with pro with product that is uh, fire uh, that will not catch fire. Uh, it is, this is a house, uh, this is a, a product that um, I have built a house out of, and I live in there. It is uh, concrete, it has no wood that goes in this structure, and it has an advantage of having a house like this uh, in the area for the fact that, as you well know, when there is a fire, each house that goes up is, a, is an additional fuel. This would be... Uh, very controlled. I mean, you cannot say it's 100% fireproof, but it is, has got over two hours of fire rating and all kinds of advantages that would be that. So there are advantages of, of uh, building this thing, this house in the neighborhood to the neighbors. And it's not, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't believe that uh, what we are doing over there uh, creates any problem, especially for the fact that we are not in uh, the view, uh, uh, primary view of anybody, uh, all of our neighbors and the location and the difference in <coughs> elevation is such that uh, we don't interrupt anybody's view. Okay. Um, is there anybody else who wishes to address the commission? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Oh, yeah, right. But you do need to fill out a speaker slip and give us a minute as well. Um, yeah, Dennis? Oh, yeah, he's gone, he's gone to get it. Okay. Um, yeah, that concludes the public hearing. We're back at the commission table. Who would like to start? Okay, Steve. Uh, just first one for Adrian. Adrian, there was a, a, a letter that you received from Jenny Mullen that had pictures of this house viewed from different locations. And one of the things you said in your staff report that it complied with the LCP rules for not being visible. Did this, any of these pictures change your opinion? So um, I, I think the letter um, indicates that there were statements made in the staff report that were incorrect, um, that the uh, statement in the staff report, which indicates that the proposed residents um, will not be visible from a scenic area, uh, scenic road, or public viewing area is incorrect. Okay. Um, but as a find in the LUP, in the land use plan of the local coastal program, um, it's not visible from um, those areas. Now, it is visible from other private streets. So Zamir is a private street as well as Ramirez Canyon. So from those public streets, the residence is visible. Okay. Uh and I'm just going to start with a couple observations from my walk down to the property. Okay. Uh, and a, a couple things. The, the house, I think and you mentioned in your presentation, the house to the north is located above you. There's a house that is planned to be built on the, to the south of you, right, on that ridge up there. So that would be another house above you. And when, when I walked down uh, to the property, one of the, one of the thoughts was, you got this deck, and if this deck is lit up, okay, it is going to be visible from a very long, primarily from those houses, okay, which is, you know, living next to a house that's lit up is not a lot of fun, but that's going to have a neat major impact on the character of that neighborhood, and also I have, you know, noise coming out of that, off of that deck, that's also going to have a negative impact on that neighborhood. Now, I got some ideas what I would do with that, but those are just two observations I had as I wandered down that path. Anybody else, though? I have a question, uh, Richard. I mean, Adrian. 
You guys look alike, believe it, in my mind. <laughs> you don't, but you do. Um, I had a hard time figuring out the basement. And I really never found a basement plan. Is there one? Yeah, there is a yeah, basement plan. I mean, is plan. it A11? Is that the closest I get? Because I'm, my real question is, is there a second exit? And it says fire access, but it doesn't say, there's no sky, skylight that I can see here. It's all garage, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But you need, you need a way out. It's so so this, this is not uh, a basement like the other basements we've seen. This is an actual garage. So uh, non-habitable non, uh, space. Uh, they do have, again, the garage door opening. Uh, there is a staircase uh, that will take uh, someone from that space to the uh, floor above, okay, as well as an elevator. That, there is a staircase. Correct. Okay, I couldn't find it. Now, um, I don't know. I couldn't find an elevation in the front of the house, but he showed one uh, that showed the garage. Do you have that anywhere? And what I'm looking for is there's a there's a rule about underground garages that have to the second and the floors above have to be set back, and I could not tell if they were. They kind of look like maybe they were, but from all these drawings, it doesn't seem they are. Or maybe we can tell from that. So, um, and maybe we can. Go back to the photographs that we show. Um, you can you well, only be able projection. to see you'd only be able to see a small portion of the second floor from the road. So uh, in order to um, have the requirement for the second floor to be set back, um, when you have a garage face in the street, is that the garage uh, has to be visible as well from the, the road. In this case, the garage is uh, at a much lower elevation, so you won't be able to see that. You will be able to see just this very small portion of the second floor uh, in the... Okay. Here. Now, when you say it's... I assume some of these pictures look like they were taken from Ramirez. Uh, no, I mean, sorry, Murphy Motorway. And I've driven up there, and it looks like you can see it. Murphy Motorway is a dedicated trail. So is that why you say it's viewable from a trail, from a public viewing spot? So um, are we uh, talking about the trail along Zamiris or no, which I'm trail? I'm talking about the trail that's dedicated on Murphy Motorway. Murphy's Motorway. Uh, well, I used to be the Butts Canyon, the Butts Ridge, what you want to call it, Murphy Motorway. Other side of Ramirez. The other side of the canyon. So, um, I'm not sure if the analysis, the visual analysis was made that the house was visible from that trail. Okay. Uh, we, we looked at other trails around the subject property. I think that trail is, is far enough that I don't think we, we made the visual analysis from there. Okay, well, it, there's nothing in between, so it is. Um, and is this house restricted on color? Because when I drove up there, there are a whole bunch of new houses that are all white, which looks kind of funky up there. Um, yeah, the, the requirement for color is for um, properties that are within a scenic area. So because we didn't make the findings, because in this case, the property is not visible from a scenic area, uh, scenic road or public viewing area, then the conditions regarding um, color was not applied to this project. I thought you said it was viewable from public viewing area. Are you saying it's not? It's not. But it would be possible to restrict, uh, to condition the project um, on color. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll let somebody else go. John, just, uh, if you look at the, the maps of pictures that uh, Jenny Mullen put in, the last two pictures, one was from Murphy Way. So it gives you a perspective okay. you're looking at. Well, I drove Murphy Way also okay. a million times. So, Chris, yeah, yeah, you can see across the canyon. Maybe you want to yeah. Yeah, just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so um, 
you know, for the table that was provided kind of at the back end of this, just doing the due diligence to check for a site plan review, how it lines up with uh, that neighborhood standards calc, we're at about two and a half or so times um, the size of the neighborhood. So just want to call that out as far as, you know, neighborhood character assessment for finding two. Um, you know, the way the code reads, uh, it just, you know, lines up for this one to be discussed. So I just want to call it out. Now, other than that, I don't have too much. Can I just um, add a few comments about the uh, habitable area table? Um, it's been a little while since we've talked about this, but um, that's attachment three in the staff report. Um, you might recall that staff began including this table because the commission um, became very concerned about large houses. And one of the things we discussed is that um, it's the ideal information to have um, for the commission would be actual permit data on all of the houses uh, within a particular radius. That's very difficult to come by as we've, you know, certainly discovered through fire rebuild research that we've been doing. But the, um, the source of information that we turned to was the assessor's data. But as we have found, um, the assessor's data um, doesn't include all of the same things that total development square footage includes. Um, and in some case studies that we did, we found that in some cases, when we compared it to recent projects, um, the assessor's data in some cases was higher than the, the permitted structure, and in some cases was lower. So it was really all over the place as far as um, being a a useful tool for this kind of analysis. Unfortunately, it's just hard information to come by in a timely manner for um, the commission's purposes. But I just wanted to remind everybody why that's included because the commission asked for it. It's not um, something that is required as part of the um, neighborhood character analysis, but it's something that the commission has been interested in. Yeah, and just, just to clarify, so in terms of what's written, and I know this has been a topic of discussion for quite a while, there's still obviously a lack of clarity as far as kind of how exactly that should be interpreted, but the way that I interpret it is how you, you know, you have to take that neighborhood standard into account, giving that rule drop at bottom 10%, uh, bottom 10 top 10%, and also factor in just some measure of what the neighborhood character is like. Um, when I quoted that number, I try to be as fair as possible for the information we have. And so I'm looking at habitable space. That ratio is about like 2.3 times the size of the, the, that calculated average per code. And then if you include the basement, it's 2.9. If you include TDSF, it's 2.4. Any way you look at it, it's, it's pretty high relative to the neighborhood. So okay. I recognize this has been something we've been going back and forth on for a while. I'm just trying to follow what's written in the code until it's changed. But, but and also, I'll just remind everybody that neighborhood standards is a different calculation for a different purpose than neighborhood character. So it's not it's not required. It's not mandatory. It's it's um, an the, adaptation. There is no calculation for neighborhood character in the code. The, the, that's a neighborhood standards calculation. So right, but, but the, the the neighborhood standards says that we can conditionally approve an increase in height. So where this is a request for. No, there, is, there is no request for neighborhood standards in this situation. This is a, this is just a neighborhood character conformance requirement due to the, the site plan review in this one. Can yeah, I okay. comment on that chart as well? Just a second. That, that was what I had. Just, just again, it's a conversation we've had several times. It's kind of jumped all over the place, but I just wanted to call it out as an observation on this project. So. David? Um, I'm just getting up to speed on neighborhood character and neighborhood standards, but when I look at this chart, the thing that jumps out to me is there are 23 different uh, projects listed and the square footage for each. Of the 23, 18 of them are more than 30 years old. And I think it's somewhat unrealistic to think that as newer houses are built, they won't incrementally get a little bit larger and a little bit larger. And when you're comparing houses from 1950, 1975, 1942, I think it's gonna skew this in strange directions. That's also true that, that up in that area, when, when, you, when you go to this house, when you turn off of Cane and Doom Road onto Zumarez, and I, I lived there for a long time too, but when you turn off of those, there's the, the immediate house just to the north of Zumarez is a sort of a colonial, a very large house. Then there's two very large houses that, are, that sit 
uh, sort of to the north of this property. You make the turn and you come around. So it's, it's um, Ramirez Canyon itself is a, is a much older community and, and um, with generally, although not entirely, but the smaller houses in, in general. Um, John? Well, you know, we, we, we've debated this a million times. Um, and we, we are required to make an neighborhood character finding. It's just a question of, and obviously the data varies, but there's a standard deviation that you look at, and, and is, it, is it relatively, our, our, our finding is, Trevor's correct, it's not a formula, okay? And we have used in the past the formula that does not apply to this code, but sort of does, to give us an idea. That's like, get rid of the top one, get rid of the bottom one, so we get sort of what the average is. We don't have to do that, but we ha what we have to do is, is uh, make a finding that it follows neighborhood character if it's a site plan review. And so the question is, can you make that finding if it's two and a half times as large? Now maybe the numbers are wrong and it's two times as large. The numbers could also be wrong, it's three times as large. So you have to decide what what's what is the character of the neighborhood and in some cases in the past we say oh we'll give them an extra 20 percent extra 30 percent from the neighborhood that way neighborhoods grow over time but i don't think it follows that if you have older houses you're not changing the character of the neighborhood by saying well it's, it's now is people like bigger houses it does change the neighborhood character so that's a finding we have to make. We tried to get the uh, city council to narrow it down, and they punted, um, totally punted. And so, and I confirmed that today, uh, that it was continued, it was never decided. So we're back in the same square. Is this reasonable for that neighborhood? And that neighborhood doesn't matter when it was built. It's it's the neighborhood. Let me um, make, I want to talk about Steve's uh, point about the deck. So on. It, because it, it, that, that was referenced in a couple of the letters that, that came from, from people in the area. Um, it, you know, it's funny. I mean, the, 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 the idea is that somehow this is all going to be lit up and it's going to be noisy. I mean, noisier, I guess, than a similar sized patio at ground level would be, although I can't see how that would necessarily be the case. And as far as the lighting is concerned, aren't, don't we have, uh, aren't, aren't there conditions put in to make it dark skies compliant in terms of lighting? Yes. So, um, so I'm not sure, I, I guess I'm not sure that I understand the, the, the nature of the complaint. Well, the only thing better than dark sky lighting is no lighting, all right? Uh, and, and there's no <clears throat> doubt in my mind, you've got those two houses, that are sitting above this thing, and whether it's dark sky lit up or not, it's going it's going to have an impact when they look out of their houses at night, looking down at this deck. Right? And I and I don't think that's what that's what the canyon's character is right now. Uh, I don't see that going on any of the houses I look down there, and I think that's going to start to dramatically change the character of that place. Well, and, and I would add one comment. I, I you know live in that area, and I have a line of sight to another ridge line, which is kind of similar situated as this house is. And I can literally hear people about 1,500 feet away from me talking in it, the regular voice, like just, just walking over there and talking. So I'm just trying to visualize if there were a rooftop deck, independent of lighting, just how much, like, and, and looking at the topography of where this resident sits relative to that canyon, which sits up behind them, you know, that would be, it is a concern as well. And just, you know, the, okay. the, 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 Hassan, the, the reason for doing this is not to have one or two people up on the deck. His plan to build this house is because he's got a lot of relatives that he wants to have a place for them to come and entertain them. Uh, so I got a bunch of people up on that deck. There's going to be noise. Well, yeah, and I and I see I see what you're talking about, and in fact, every new house in every neighborhood has effect on on the people who live around you, and 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 I I, I just I'm, I'm trying to figure out how how you would uh, let's say that this house was 800 square feet with a rooftop deck, 
how how would you deal on a, from a planning point of view? How would you deal with the fact that there might be people up there? I mean, how, what what you know? You, how, we, how do you restrict that? I'd right? phrase it another way, and that's the, does, yeah. do we reasonably believe that this proposed development doesn't impact neighborhood character? I come back to what's just written in the LCP, and that, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to evaluate on. Right, okay. So that's not an abstract. Right, but the right. answer, one answer to your question is you can put conditions like downward shielding lights that are no higher than, you know, your, your kneecaps, and they have to focus down rather than up. So whatever your lights you're having are shielded down towards the ground. Well, we've already got those conditions, but that's Steve's saying that's not enough. No, I understand. I'm just yeah, saying okay. you right. can restrict it further. Yeah. And, and, and again, I, you know, I, one of the, one of the, I lost this battle a long time ago, but one of the things that, that is important to me is certainty and predictability of result. And, and when, you know, we can do this in a couple of ways, it seems to me, as a city, we can go back to the way that we used to be done, where instead of, instead of having applicants go through the planning department and the fire department and environmental health and this person and that person and every other person who has to agree to it before it comes to us, you can go, you can develop a system of, of approval in concept where, where this decision and this discussion takes place very early on in the process. But we don't do that and we haven't done that and haven't done it for years. Okay. And instead what we do is we make people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars based upon the rules that, that were written into the code and then they come here and they find out that, well, we, you know, my view of a neighborhood character is not as expansive as yours. And so, therefore, you don't get to build your house. So maybe you want to come back. Maybe you want to re redesign it. And, well, we can't tell you what we would approve. Try again. You know, this, is, this is a bizarre process okay. that we've caught and, ourselves And in. let's talk about that, okay? Because in this case, there was communication to the planning staff, okay, while this house was being developed. This Eva Turn, whatever heck, Turn, Turnchuk, whatever heck her name was. Yeah. Okay, she communicated to the city staff those basic concerns. It says you got a deck, it's going to light up the place, that's not good, it's going to create noise. If you read the staff report, it says, oh, we talked to her and we solved all her issues. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. All right? And I think there was some amount of understanding the staff has to have regarding the neighborhoods in Malibu. And what a house like this does to that character. And, and you're right. I mean, having to get to the end and then, and then try and fix it is a pain for everybody. But by the same token, somebody, as this thing is coming, all they had to do was walk down that pathway. And they could have seen the houses above it, and they could look and say, the light's going to have an impact on those people. Well, and and that, that's part of what I believe staff should be doing. Staff does site visits. Staff always encourages applicants to reach out to neighbors to um, find out what their concerns are in advance. But we have a code that was, you know, adopted by city council, and that's those are the rules we have to work from. And so we can make suggestions here and there. But at the end of the day, if something complies with the code, then we and it's you know a complete submittal. They've done everything. Um, that they have to do in terms of story polls and all that stuff, we have to move it forward. And there's not, I'm not comfortable exercising discretion in terms of um, telling somebody they can't do something that the code not a matter of telling them they can't. It's telling them that if you go and look at this neighborhood, okay, that what you're building does not fit. And you're, and you're going to run into a problem. And, and if they and know we that while they're building that. it, I don't, then I don't have a problem if they get to this point and try, somebody says it's not good. All right, let me, let me stop you for just a second. Um, uh, one of the things that I've developed over the years is the ability to count to three. And, and so I'm going to ask you, Mr. Azad, uh, you hear that perhaps there is opposition to this project. Are, there's, there's two ways that, that there, there's several things that can happen. We can put it to a vote, and it'll either pass or fail or be conditioned in some way, perhaps. Or if you wish, uh, you can ask the matter to be continued, go back, redesign it based upon some of the concepts you've heard here tonight. It's really your choice, um, but um, I'm just I'm sort of putting this, it out there to you. Can I can I make a couple of comments before that? Um, not general comments, but if you re want to respond to what I'm asking you, that then you can respond to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, all right. The, the reason I'm uh, hesitating is the fact that uh, we have had these conversations before. Uh, 
the planner uh, had a conversation with this lady, Eva, whatever the name is, and uh, the result of that was communicated to me, and they said that there is no problem. She agreed that there was no problem at the time of the conversation. That's what I got from the planner. And that's why we continue to the way the way we have. Okay, okay. So, yes, just, let me let me just stop, interrupt you for just a second, John. I, I just think uh, he would be, if we spend another five minutes or so discussing what we're talking about, it may make it easier for him to make the discussion. Because, you know, it, it, it's an amorphous thing, and you don't want to come back and think it's all the deck or all the lighting or all this or all or what some lady said, okay? You have to convince us. And and what I'm looking at personally Just is, is... Let us go on for a few minutes more. Just have a seat. We'll be back. For, yeah, we'll be back what for I'm more. looking at personally is we say we have codes, and they're, they're, they're this way, and you got to follow them. Well, it's not really true, because we have findings we have to make that are amorphous. And they were passed by the Coastal Commission and certified by the City Council and adopted in the Municipal Code. So we have to make like this neighborhood standards finding. But unfortunately for us, our pay grade stops there. Uh, we can't decide. The City Council, if you want to change the laws and what's required, the City Council has to do it. A while back, they sent us an a, a, a assignment to come up with a hard and fast rule on safe for the size. And we came up with a plan and it went to the city council and they said, I basically got, got I, I shouldn't characterize them, but they, they basically punted, okay? They didn't make the decision. So we're stuck back with this amorphous decision is does this fit the neighborhood character? Well, that's, that depends on your philosophy. So I try personally to, yeah, I, I'm a I'm a slow growth guy, but I try personally to be fair, saying, what's the neighborhood look like, and I want it to grow over time because things grow over time, so I'm gonna give it a little extra. But when I get a a plan, and I'm just talking about myself, but this is the situation we're in because we each have to make that decision. There is nothing in our code that says if you come in with a plan like this, you pass. Okay. There is nothing like that. It should be that way. Jeff's right, okay? But it isn't. So I have to make a decision, and when I see something that's two and a half times the average, and then Bonnie tells me, well, those numbers are a little squirrely, then I adjust them a little and say maybe you give it another 10 or 15%, and so maybe I could go 140 times, 140% or something. But when it's 250 then I pull back. And, and so it's very hard for us to tell you, come back in with 428, uh, 4,280 4, square feet. You know, that's just a, a number. You know, it's just something, and, and, and he may disagree with me, and you may disagree with me when it comes back. So it's, it's the concept. Does it fit the neighborhood? <laughs> now, there's things we can do, in my opinion, to fix things like decks. Okay, we have dark sky, we have, we can put restrictions on use, things like that if we want to, to make it come through. Uh, but when it comes to neighborhood character, I believe the staff makes a mistake telling, telling the applicant that no, you know, they, ca they can't really calculate it that way because it's a different section of the code. We have to make a decision that it's either too big for the neighborhood or it fits. And that's very amorphous, and it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's the city council's fault. If the city council had come in and said, this is the number, that's the number. But they haven't. That's the only thing I want to say. Okay. David? Well, we, we have two members of this commission who live in the immediate area, so by whatever amorphous standard or otherwise, I'm quite curious as to your opinions on how this fits in with your view of the neighborhood character, by any standard. I live on Zubaris, by the way. <laughs> Three? <laughs> you well, I, to to see you uh, yeah, no, I, I, uh, 
what we used to do before, before in the old days. 2002. <laughs> before 2002, is that is that the idea was look, is it a residential structure? Does it is it in terms of size, bulk, and height? Wasn't wasn't that the formulation we used? You'd look at it in terms of size, bulk, and height, and it was sort of a uh, an aesthetic kind of uh, approach. Um, and a lot of our codes were designed along an aesthetic uh, approach. The two-thirds rule was a, it's an aesthetic rule. Um, the total development square footage limitations were put in at the very beginning of, of um, cityhood, basically. Developed the, the interim zoning ordinance. And, um, and the idea was that, okay, th this is the maximum that you can go to based upon your lot size. And the idea is that if you have more acreage, that you can build a larger house. And if you have less acreage, you can build a smaller house. You have to build a smaller house. And, and, and that was the idea that we lived with for a long time. Stay within the rules. Stay within the setbacks. Stay within the height limitations. And if you wanted to go above 18 feet and not above 24 or 28, depending on your flat, whether your roof was flat or not, um, then, then you had to make sure that you didn't get in anybody's view. You had to stay out of protected views. And that was pretty much the way it was, and that's the way it was approved. Now, in, what was it, 2002, 2002 uh, there was a different election, uh, different attitude take, took over, uh, and that was we, we need to get smaller houses, we need to stop approving larger houses. But unfortunately, we weren't given any standard by which to judge what a larger or a smaller house is. So um, I, I, I try not to look at this thing and say, you know, is this, is this a house I would live in? Is this a house I would want to live in? Uh, in fact, it wouldn't. I don't like large houses. I would always be looking for my glasses or, the, or you know, what I do with the beer that I was just drinking. Um, so, so, you know, look, I'm a lawyer, you're a lawyer. It's a, it's a, it's a horrible thing that develops over the years, but you tend to be rule driven. And that's, and, and so as a result, uh, I would condition the house in terms of lighting. I would condition the house in terms of color. I condition the house in terms of maybe the, the, the even the, the, the uh, although we do have sound limitations, there might be additional sound limitations that I'd be willing to accept. But in terms of the house size, no, I see this as being a, an unremarkable uh, deviation, if you want to call it that, from, from the size of the surrounding houses. Question? Oh, uh, Chris? Uh, uh, yeah, I'd already weighed in. Did you want any more input on that, or what, what specific you're thinking on that one? Dave? Like, you, you disagree with it? Yeah, yeah, I'd already stated my position, though, unless you wanted to talk it through anymore. No, no, okay. and by the way, the night lighting, it, I, it is in the biology section, so I need to have it. Yeah, just so you know, it's required now. Yeah, right. Right. That is a rule. <laughs> okay, well, okay, let me, let me tell you what I'm thinking. I agree with what you said earlier that the older houses are probably smaller, and the newer houses are going to be bigger. Uh, but at least the thought process I've always gone through is, you know, I don't want to wake up tomorrow morning and have all 8,000 square foot houses, okay? So you'd like to see a process where the, the neighborhood grows over time, right? There is some growth that takes place, bigger houses come in, but nothing comes in immediately and sort of overwhelms what's, what's already there. I read the, the, you know, the, in the staff report, the finding for neighborhood character. Project does not adversely affect neighborhood character. But there's not a word in there about the fact that the lights would be different. It would be more noise. I mean, there's nothing in there that talks about the, what makes Ramirez Canyon, Ramirez Canyon, why people live there. They live there because it's dark. They live there because it's quiet. They live there because it's off the beaten path. That, that's not discussed anywhere in here. And I think that is part of what we're trying to protect for some of these smaller neighborhoods. My, now, my thought says, I think I get rid of the top deck. I mean, I'm not sure why it's there, but I don't see how, even, I don't care whether you condition it for no noise, no light. The longer it lasts, they're going to light it up, get rid of it so it doesn't impact the neighbors. That would be my... Okay, so let me... Would you be willing to vote for the project if it didn't have a top deck? Maybe. 
<laughs> well, then we're going to be here all night. <laughs> um, I was trying to prolong this discussion to give him a better idea of what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, we've, we've I, made, just made it worse. <laughs> I, I, no, I would like to have it come back. Uh, I'd like to have him ask for a continuance, but that's his choice. Uh, I don't know if you understand what we're talking about, but um, I think in this case, a 230% of what the average is, it's going to be hard to convince me that this particular project uh, size is appropriate. Well, John, I lived in 5908 Zumiers Drive starting 38 years ago. That, is, uh, that house is 5,500 square feet. It's, uh, when you look at this, this, this house, it is not so extraordinary, uh, uh, you know, when you compare it with the houses that are built new. You cannot, I mean, lifestyles have changed, things have changed, and it's not possible to live in a, well, I mean, I shouldn't say it's not possible, but it just doesn't work properly for people's lifestyles. That's, that's the situation. As far as the, uh, the, the restrictions from the light and from color, and uh, I'll be more than happy to accept that. As a matter of fact, uh, we discussed that with uh, Mr. Oering, and, uh, and I said, sure. We won't have any lighting on the, on the roof area. But then why do you live in Malibu? You live in Malibu because of the view. You live in Malibu because of the sun. You live in Malibu because of the air that is there. So if you have a deck on the, on the upstairs on, uh, on top, that's, that's what you're doing. And if anybody looks at me and thinks that I'm going to be dancing till 2 in the morning, uh, you know, having big parties, I think uh, I'll thank you, but uh, I will, that would not be the case. All right, well, you've heard. I, I think you, we're ready for that. You've heard what we're, how we're leaning. Um, do you want to withdraw the, or, or actually the matter be continued so that you could work on a redesign, or would you just rather have us go ahead and vote? Um, did, did you get an answer over there? Yeah, his, <laughs> his answer was maybe. <laughs> Out of depth. That maybe is a yes. <laughs> well, we can't do I that. I wouldn't bet on it. We can't vote unless you tell us to vote. Well, no, yeah. we, we can't continue it unless you tell us to continue yeah, it. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, why don't we continue this for, for, for a period of time? Let me have a discussion and do some more soul searching and see what we can do. Do we want, do we want a date certain? A how, how long of a continuance would you want? A, probably no more than 60 days. Okay. So, Bonnie, can let's you come just, up with a date? Just, let's just see if we, could, if we have to re-notice or not. I think it would be a good idea to re-notice just because the neighbors are, would right. like to be All right, board. so let's do it to a date uncertain, and you, okay. you'll, you'll come up with some. All right, yeah. the idea would be to continue it to a date uncertain. Bonnie would come up with a time that would fit within the, ca the, the framework we're talking about, and, uh, and the neighbors would all be re-noticed, and we would go do this again. Um, okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to continue the item? I move we continue the item to a date uncertain. Is there second. a second? Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay. Talk about okay. kicking the ball. Um, now, I, I may suggest that we've got 49 minutes. Right. We're going and to, that we may want to combine 5E with 6A. Uh, we're going to bring 6E, 6A yeah, up now. We're going to hear 6A, which is just a report. Yeah. And then we're going to and go directly hear. to 5 E. Five, five E, I believe. Right. Yeah, five E. The question is whether you want to continue five F at this point or if you want to. Well, we might make it. I'm sorry, what? Okay. Yeah, we, we might be able to do this. Okay. Um. Good evening, Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, the purpose of this item is to uh, give some insight onto 
the actions that have been taken both by city staff and the applicants uh, in regards to working to address the concerns that were raised at the various planning commission hearings last summer. When this was last heard by the planning commission as part of the conditional use permit amendment for SOHO, the commission had asked that the city's traffic engineer uh, look at the parking and circulation plans for Nobu and SOHO and make a recommendation on how to uh, try to address some of the concerns with uh, addressing enough parking in the lot, circulation in the lot, and backups onto Pacific Coast Highway, and then all of the various vehicle maneuvers on the highway that posed a safety threat. City staff has met with the applicant on three or to four occasions to go over various plans. There were a number of alternatives that were discussed. Um, we've kind of narrowed it down to one or two proposed uh, items. Uh, however, in order to implement that, there are some changes that would be needed on the roadway, which is the jurisdiction of Caltrans. So before we bring anything to this commission, we've tasked the applicant with working with Caltrans to find out if these would be feasible modifications to the roadway. The, they have been working with Caltrans and city staff is following up and uh, approaching Caltrans as well. So we are available for any questions as well as the applicant and they have a presentation as well to show uh, some of the, uh, the proposals they have with the parking uh, that we're looking at which includes some barriers along the highway uh, that would help prevent some of the left-hand turn conflicts we've been seeing. Ben, do we yes. need, need disclosures on this type of item? Um, this, I, we really don't need to. Um, this is just a receive and file. Um, I have a secret speaker slip from uh, Dr. Antonio Coco. Is that you? Um, you yeah, have, you, you're... Good evening. Yeah. My name is Antonio Coco, and I'm the president of Coco Traffic Planners. And uh, I was retained by Nobu uh, to look at this uh, issue that I'm sure you are very familiar with because it's been a, a, a while. Let Go me ahead. stop you for just a second, Dr. Sure. Coco. Um, th this isn't really the time for us to do a full uh, analysis of, of your plan. Uh, we were basically getting a report. I don't want to get into a big discussion of the merits or demerits of the report because we've got another item to do. So if you could, and you've only got three minutes to present. So if you could just give us oh, a, three minutes, uh, give us an abbreviated look at what you're talking about okay. and, then, and then we can move on. All right. Well, I was planning on a little bit more than three minutes, but since we have only three minutes, uh, we'll uh, go straight to what uh, at the present time appears to be the uh, the easiest and most uh, viable solution to the issues that I'm sure you are aware of, but I would like to stress, uh, if I may, uh, basically we have two uh, uh, uses that Soho and, and Nobu that have to uh, access this uh, and to share the parking. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there have been a, a couple of issues with the traffic on PCH that uh, some, you know, many of the uh, complained about and basically is the fact that uh, many times the traffic is such that uh, it backs uh, people that want to get into the site um, will back into the through lanes of PCH and that you know creates uh, some problems. So uh, we have analyzed basic, I, I would like to say we analyzed just about any possible way to get in and out of this place and that are uh, six options and uh, with out of six options what we're presenting tonight which is the uh the the best uh in the short term okay for sure that uh, that will solve uh most of the problems uh with the understanding that there is no solution that will solve every problem there is not perfect solution but we're trying to come up with something that is probably the best uh, as you can see there, uh, this is um, this is option six, but uh, uh, probably is better if we can get to the other section 
uh, option uh, six. That's it. Okay. All right. So basically, if you can, uh, uh, if you see that that is uh, the parking. On the east side, which is to the right, there is a, a, a driveway that right now is used for exit only for, um, no, sorry, for, uh, for an exit only. And right now, everybody comes in from the middle driveway, both eastbound and westbound. And, uh, and then uh, from uh, the western driveway, there is the exit for, uh, for Seoul. Uh, what we're proposing is to put uh, the, some uh, uh, refractorized uh, delineators, the ones that you see most in most places around along PCH. You know those yellow ones are pretty, pretty sturdy, and uh, uh, will definitely convince everybody not to make a left turn. So um, at the same time, we're proposing to uh, we we'll work with Adam. And uh, we're thinking about extending the left turn lane, pocket lane. You see what the two arrows? Okay, right now the, 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 the left turn pocket lane is a lot shorter. We're extending it and covering everything with these delineators so the people that are coming from the east will keep on going west and they will have to uh, make a U-turn at the next light and come back and come in from the west. Uh, this uh, solution is, you know, fairly, I mean, we hope that it's fairly fast because uh, Caltrans will still be involved in approving uh, this installation. But my understanding is that in the past it has been tried and was working. I believe was, uh, was it with the, the sheriff, with the, the sheriff that uh, the participation and it worked, it worked uh, and uh, so, what we're here tonight to show you is this solution that uh, in the short term for sure it will, uh, we think, improve condition. For sure from a safety standpoint, will improve the fact that uh, you, you're not going to have any uh, flow, a traffic flow of, you know, spilling over into the, through traffic, through lanes on PCH. Okay. That is a big issue. So, um, having said that, you know, there are other solutions that uh, we may uh, present and we can, may work. But for the time being, what we agreed with Adam and, uh, and the city is that uh, this is probably in the short term the best solution to improve, to make things better. And it would be worth trying because it's, it shouldn't take too much to, uh, to test it mm -hmm. and work on it. And then in the meantime, if there is any, any need, we can go ahead with the other solution that I have been discussing with Caltrans. And of course, Caltrans, uh, you probably know, is a little bit, uh, you know, <laughs> a behemoth that doesn't want to move. But uh, I have found some, uh, you know, they, they were willing to, uh, to listen to other solutions. There are spe specifically one is the number four, number five that in my report, that uh, are viable and they were open. Uh, so in the short term, this is what we're presenting and we would uh, you know, like to uh, have approved. And then uh, you know, based upon the results, we will see if there is any changes that will be made or will need to be made later. But in the meantime, we do have other alternatives and we may be able to you know, proceed and, and uh, follow, try to get those other alternatives. Okay, let me stop for just a second step. Where are we procedurally in this? Uh, is, this going to, is this going to come back to us uh, for approval? Is that, is that what we're talking about now? You, you have a CUP amendment in to change the, to uh, adjust the valet for both Soho and Nobu. So this is an update about the progress towards that. Once there's a solution, it'll come back to you as part of the CUP amendment for those. Okay, properties. so we'll have an opportunity to, to discuss it. This is just an update where we're at. It's not a, uh, you're, you're not making any decision on the CUP amendment tonight. Can I just ask a quick question? Let's just, let's just be real quick because very, we can't hear a new item after 1030. Very, it's 30 seconds. Assuming that this is accepted and recommended by the commission, how quickly will Caltrans implement what it is you've suggested here? Well, uh, that probably Adam might be. Uh... Yeah, good evening, uh, commissioners. Uh, I've spoken to Caltrans about this. Um, it's an encroachment permit process. Um, it, 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 they're trying to do a turnaround of about 30 days um, once they have the uh, exact layout 
um, and engineered plans associated with what you're seeing here today. Yeah. Okay, John. Uh, is the reason you ended the the paddles at at the uh, Soho uh, boundary just because it's the Soho boundary, or no, uh, no? Is there a reason you didn't extend this a little bit further so people don't hang at you? Well, uh, I mean, the idea and, is that we want to make sure that nobody uh, thinks about making a U-turn right there. Yeah, that, I'm just so we want to extend it. If Sorry. They, they, if they could make a U-turn right there, uh, well, you have a conflict with the Roku entrance right there also. Well, yeah. There are, I there just are, wondered if you could add another 50 feet or something. Oh, we certainly can. Yeah. This is just okay. an idea, just to give you an idea of what the solution that we've come up with is. Now, if it's over there, I put 230 feet. Uh, that's because we um, extended the, the left turn pocket lane. Before that was 290 feet, but we can certainly add another 50 feet. You know, it's just a. I, I don't want to cut you off, but we're, I'm under a lot of time pressure here. One more quick, one quick more question. question: When are we going to see a long-term plan of how we fix what's going on at Nobu and Soho? I mean, the situation that says I got cars on the street, I got employees parking on the street. They have come up with suggestions of how to fix it. They've talked about shuttles. They've talked about the willingness to implement those shuttles. They've talked about the, the, the willingness to pay for those shuttles. And let's Question do mark. something. Question the question is, when are we going to see a long-term plan? Well, what we're, we're working on to get, uh, together is a phased approach. Uh, this would be kind of like the first phase, make observations, see how um, it, it would work, implement. Um, there's a lot of safety concerns, obviously, with left turn um, turns into the site. Um, there's a, a second phase that uh, Antonio hasn't shown, but that's relocating the crosswalk and potentially having two um, separate driveway entrances. I know you don't have a lot of time tonight, but um, the problem you that got one's is a little you bit get more. Pounds of cars trying to fit into a five pound bag. Yeah, you need so a better plan. We know what that, we know, we know what the problem is. I got one speaker, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, while Thank he's you, walking up, I'll just mention that the city manager is um, entertaining whether we could do a pilot program involving the city's um, chili cook-off property under a TUP that could involve shuttling employees and that kind of thing. So that's in the works also. There's also an LCP amendment about parking as a standalone use that's also going forward that'll be needed if the shuttle goes forward. Okay. Brian? Um, this uses terminology that we were not uh, familiar with previously. We're talking about raised lane dividers or candlesticks, uh, vertical delineators, and those are like headstones. It, it says we've got a problem here that we can't fix on our own property. This is putting mitigations out in the middle of Pacific Coast Highway. Um, Steve Uring is absolutely correct on this project. This whole thing is a nuisance driven. I don't know what happened with the nuisance problem. You're creating safety hazards. You don't address the safety hazards with some uh, a driving maze out in the middle of the highway. So uh, if these go in, there are a big maintenance burden, and you have to close down two lanes to glue them back down on the ground. That's going to impact all the 100,000 cars that travel up and down Pacific Coast Highway. They may do it in the middle of the night. Then you got the lighting and, and the lane closures and the beeping trucks and the whole bit because they're working in the middle of the night. So this is another kick the can down the road answer to a problem that is being avoided. And the bigger problem needs to be addressed. But making a mess of Pacific Coast Highway with all these, let's try this, let's try that. That's not the right approach. Yeah, I'm sorry, you. may I answer one second? Uh, I mean, actually, we are eliminating one of the major issues of safety with this solution. And, and, and this may very well be an, an interim solution, but we're still working on the others that require longer time because Caltrans and there is the Coastal Commission and a bunch of other issues that have to be resolved. So we're talking about a year, maybe, maybe less, maybe more, but this is something that in the short term will eliminate the safety issue of the uh, Cues or spilling onto eastbound, oh, sorry, westbound PCH. Okay. That's gone. All right. Thank you, Dr. Coker. I really appreciate it. And excuse me for, for cutting you off, but but we've got people who have been waiting. That, oh, I agree. Night. That's fine. I understand it. But okay. do, are, do we have a, are we going to have a, you know, some kind of resolution, something, or what oh, can we do? This report comes to us, and, and our job is to receive and file it. We don't take a vote on it. 
when you when you come back to present your plan, there will be a, an application, and then we will have a full airing of it, and we will. All right. So, are we going to do a plan on this solution? Yeah. And, and you're going to continue to work with staff uh, okay. regarding this, regarding what you're going to put forward. I, I just want to say to give give an answer to what's going on here. Uh, I, I looked at this plan earlier. I think it does a tremendous amount to make the highway safer for people coming coming from the east. And uh, I think you should push it as fast as you can. Okay. So, so. That, definitely. And thank, I, thank you. And I did have a question for Adam. Is, is there any way to implement this, like, on a temporary basis, um, you know, with some flags or something to see how the patterns arise? Unfortunately, um, based on observations with the cameras and the video, with cones, it doesn't have that uh, emphasis. Vehicles just drive right over it. So. Got it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. So let's go yeah. back to the... Thank you. Thank you very much. To five, what is it, 5E? Yeah, yeah the conditional use. So this is uh, item 5E on the agenda, conditional use permit amend, amendment 19003. This is to amend the conditional use permit for the operation of Little Soho Beach House. Staff report, please. Oh, I'll try to make this brief for you. Last Thanks. summer, we were here with a request from the Soho House to add um, amplified sound as well as live music to their conditional use permit, modify their hours of operation so that they could stay open later on holiday eves and holidays when they fall on weekdays, and also to allow for the hours of alcohol service uh, to begin and coincide with their breakfast service. Uh, currently now the alcohol service is staggered to later in the morning. The applicant now is before you um, as requested with the evidence based on the tests that they performed. They in, uh, set up the speaker system that was proposed at the last meeting and conducted tests to see how that would impact uh, the surrounding neighborhoods and they worked with neighbors uh, from along the coast and up into the hills, uh, Ridgemont um, uh, area, which overlooks the, the club. And the results of that are included as your, in your uh, staff report as the attachment that's labeled the December sound study. That study details the system that was used and the results. Uh, the applicant is also as part of this conditional use permit amendment. Uh, they've removed the request for live entertainment, it would now only be amplified or pre-recorded amplified sound uh, is my understanding. And also they wish to continue to pursue a modification to the hours of operation and hours for alcohol service. Since the parking solution, the valet and offsite parking, since that's part of a larger program that's going to involve both properties, that would come to you as a separate CUP as it is proposed right now. Uh, staff has received positive feedback from the neighbors. I had a conversation this morning with the HOA that is above the Soho House restaurant. And out of that discussion, staff recommends that if this is adopted tonight, that the resolution be amended to include the December sound study report that was prepared by their consultant. That would be included as an attachment, or excuse me, as an exhibit to the resolution so that it's essentially memorialized and should there be any question in the future, it would live with the resolution. The HOA is also seeking to ask for some sort of mechanism that they be notified to perhaps a condition that if there should be any changes to this conditional use permit amendment relating to sound, that the Soho House management first approach the HOA before coming to the city. I explained to the HOA that such a condition would be difficult for us as we tend to stay out of private uh, agreements. And also, we do not defer our decision making beyond uh, outside the city. Uh, but I believe a representative from the HOA is here this evening uh, based on my phone call earlier. I'm available for any questions, and the applicant is as well. All right, thank you very much. We've got uh, the applicant team, Ken Ehrlich, and um, it looks like just two of us, Ken Ehrlich and Thomas Leonard, I want to thank um, the Soho House staff as well as my colleague, Monica Briseño, in allowing us to be here tonight and bringing this forward. We have a very brief PowerPoint. Um, hopefully, is it queued up, Richard? 
It, we should do disclosures. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Ken. I'm trying to hurry too quickly. No worries, Mr. Spencer. Uh, disclosures for. Yeah, so uh, did visit the, between the last meeting and this meeting, so I could get a better sense of the speaker configuration, I did visit the site uh, just to be to hear it in person as well. And then I did talk a bit with Richard on this. Other than that, no additional disclosures. John? Uh, I did meet with Steve, uh, with Thomas and Meyer, uh, to discuss the whole situation in general, but mainly with Thomas on seeing where the speakers were and all that kind of stuff. That was last week. I can't remember the day. Yeah, well, I, I met with John. We met with Meyer and Thomas. Uh, again, encouraging them to make sure we had the evidence that the sound study they did was actually accepted by the neighbors and they provided that, and that's what they were required to do. David? I have not met with them. I was put up for membership to Soho House two or three years ago, never heard back. I don't hold a grudge. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be about 40 years younger. Nothing for me. Go ahead, Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the setting hasn't changed since the last time we were here or the time before that. Um, a local social club, not open to the public. Uh, the space includes a sitting room terrace, bar and dining, really a creative space for creative people to be creative with each other, to collaborate uh, with themselves and their guests. Um, very, very important to have music and the arts to be celebrated in this kind of a community and this kind of experience. There are existing conditions about requirements to have certain amount of percentages of Malibu residents uh, involved as members, and that's always been upheld. Um, a continuing commitment to being a good neighbor with, with, the na with the community itself, and that's exactly what we've done with the December sound study and the, 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 the feedback and input we've received from the community since then. The permitting background, I don't know how much this is, of this is relevant to what we're here to do tonight. Um, to put it bluntly, we've really tried to streamline the process and Soho House has essentially removed itself from driving the whole traffic and parking side of this, and Nobu has really taken the lead in that. Um, and we've certainly been in partnership with them. I don't mean to imply anything else, but they're really taking the lead. The, our true interest here is the music, and that's really what we're talking about here is the music and hours of operation. Um, most important, in December of this past year, um, we invited the community in at our expense. I mean, this was a, a, more than a six-figure expense to Soho House to install essentially all the electronics and the, the system that we said we were going to install, had the neighbors in, had um, our engineers with them, as well as engineers in the community, um, and, and Thomas could most probably describe it better than I can, but we've said everything we were going to do, we've done everything we were going to say, we're, we're fine with having the December results incorporated into whatever resolution comes tonight as requested by the neighbors, but our understanding is that we've come to an agreement on the operation of the sound system and we're willing to abide by it. We are willing to abide by the proposed uh, resolution from the staff with the incorporation of the sound study. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. You've got 12 minutes and 40 seconds left uh, if you need it for rebuttal. Um, is there anybody else in the audience who wants to address the commission on this item? I don't hear anybody, so we're going to close the public hearing and come back to the commission table to see what okay. we can do in a very short time. Uh, I just want to recap. I was the chair when that you guys came before us the last time. It, the deal was if you could get your neighbors to agree to what uh, the, the sound was, that it was going to be okay with us. So they had, they had done that. The only thing I would suggest as you move forward, Thomas, you're leading. I think, right? You're, you're going to move on to bigger and better things. You're leaving some big shoes you have to fill. Thank you very much for your help. But my suggestion is, over time, God knows what's going to happen. I've got a neighbor, for example, we've had a dog that's been barking for years. The neighbor went out and got a new set of hearing aids, and all of a sudden the dog's barking too loud. So <laughs> a lot of stuff can happen. But so I would recommend that you make sure whoever's taking over for you, their phone number is given to all the neighbors. So if there's a concern as opposed to coming back in front of us, they call somebody at your shop and they fix it. Because you've demonstrated that if you work with these folks, you can make it work and you just want to continue doing that if you would, please. 100% agree and we'll make sure that happens. Thank you. John? Uh, a couple of questions on that, Richard, and, and maybe Thomas. Uh, Richard, is there anything in here that 
kicks off a, uh, a violation, uh, uh, neighbor complaints or anything like that, or is it up, you know, when we give CUPs, they go on forever. Um, is that built into the system at all? There are two conditions. Condition number five, it says the planning director shall have the ability to lower the approved sound level if verified complaints are received. And the condition number six, uh, states that the operator shall cease the use of the amplified music sound system upon notice by the planning director of three sequential violations. Okay, so it's up to the planning director to be on top of it. Verified complaints, yes. Right, and verified means the, the uh, code enforcement officer writes something up. Oh, evidence presented to us, yes. Okay, um, now... So what happens in the case of a TUP and a party? Uh, and, what? and a party. Say, like, the, you got criticized a while back for some New Year's party where the fireworks were a big deal or something. I think it was a couple of years ago, but it, are these rules just normal and then you can override them with a TUP? Or uh, is, is this all the time? This would be all the time. We can't issue a TUP for something that would conflict with any of the rules in the conditional use permit. Okay. And uh, notification of the neighbors. I understand your problem, but aren't, aren't the neighbors, can't they sign up to be notified of anything that happens there as far as new applications? We can add them as an interested party to the property uh, and any public notice that would be any time a notice is required by code to be sent out, they would get that. So uh, they're obviously not here. So can Some somebody here. tell them that? Some They'll get the here. word. Go They'll ahead. get the word. Okay. Um, well, I think they've done a very credible job and uh, you know, it's the follow through the counts and, and, I do want to emphasize, though, that the big problem is still out there. And uh, I normally I don't like to give CUPs when there's major violations. But they did what we asked them to do, and I'm going to vote for this. David? Nothing. I read it. I was impressed with the uh, report and the detail, and particularly involving the community to the extent you did, and I think it looks very good. Chris? First off, I agree. Thanks for recording everything. Thanks for taking the time to show me what the you know what everything was. Um, but I'm going to channel my inner hill for a second. Um, there were you know there was a sound study done. I'm just trying to play you know play like I'm sound. Are there any conditions that an engineer advised on where like maybe there could be some type of like an inversion going on or something that would redirect that sound up? Was that taken into account in the study or is that of any concern? We have a sound expert here tonight. Great, thank you. Yes. Yes what? Yes. It was a... taken into okay. account. Yeah. Good. And so can... we we actually kind of shifted. We kept shifting the night that we were going to go out into the neighborhood to make sure that we dodged uh, atypical atmospheric conditions, um, anything that could hide or anything that could uh, allow the sound system to be drowned out or covered. So we had we were dodging rain. So rain's a big thing that we have to make sure that we avoid because tire noise gets emphasized, so traffic would mask it. So if we did it on a night when it was wet, uh, for instance, then we could turn it up louder and be like, well, the neighbors didn't hear it, ha, ha, ha. Right. But when it's dry, the traffic noise won't be as loud because the uh, rubber to asphalt noise will be lower because it's not wet. So yeah, we actually purposely did that. I think we had to move. I think we had to move our test date three times to make sure that we avoided atmospheric conditions that would penalize the HOA and um, give a buffer to uh, Little Beach House. And were there any conditions you could project, like if, say, a fog rolled in, is there anything you could, you know, conditions that could occur that would somehow uh, redirect that sound towards those residences? Uh, yeah, it was, so what you would do, again, same thing, we tried to do this Winter time helps because um, sound uh, speed of sound in air is um, faster when it's cold and when it's humid. So we did it on a typical December evening. We did it when it was dry. We did it in your 80th percentile of weather Perfect. that you find in Southern California. So 
this should be the pretty much typical condition you run into at least 80% of the time. Thank you. I, I did have a couple more. I'm sorry if I may. Yeah. Um, does, I, I know that you had uh, shared that, uh, now this is to, I think, Mr. Ehrlich perhaps can. Um, just you, th there were a number of people when we visited the property um, that, uh, that were shared that they did have concern. Have all those been invited and all those participate in this? So there's no outliers that still might come back up and get uh, have a p opposition? All, all of the interested parties were involved in the study and all of that's in the report. Um, yeah, and I think, Richard, you, you've spoken, the city has spoken and had verbal and written confirmation from everybody who was a part of the process. Okay, and then last, just is there, is this at all tied together? Because this is a change in use. Would this impact kind of the parking plans? I'm just kind of thinking if there's any interplay between uh, projects. Well, this, if, if you approve this here, they wouldn't, this is self-contained. You're approving only this adjustment to the CUP. So, um, it, it, it would, I mean, uh, you're, you're, I mean, you're not requiring them to make any changes to the parking. There's no changes to the parking that are being proposed as part of this CUP amendment here. So, this so they still have a CUP amendment out there about parking, but if they withdraw or move away from that one, you're, you should approve this, anticipating that this is what the CUP is and that's what's gonna be binding on them right now. Okay, okay, and that kind of plays into John's concern where there might, you know, your, your perception, John, is there are some more violations, those are being addressed separately, so we'll just consider this separately and we're good with that. Yeah, my only message was, don't forget the big big guys out there. Can I ask a super quick question of the town engineer? Uh, Thomas told us when we met with him that there's a limiter. You yes. can't turn it up above, so some Correct. drunk can't come up and go, Crank yeah, it. it's, it's back of house, it's in the manager's office. It doesn't even have knobs. You okay. have to literally hardwire a laptop into it and the software is not easy to run. So even a manager who has not been trained on it would not be able to jump into it and edit it and, uh, and uh, increase it okay, that, easily. That's thank you. Can't Spinal tap now. Turn it up right. to 11. <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, I'm uh, looking for a motion here. I got a motion. I will make a motion that we approve the staff report uh, with the Recommend with the uh, addition. Staff's recommendation. Staff, Staff recommendation. Is that a commitment from you guys to make sure you keep in touch with your neighbors? And staff recommendation as presented. Staff recommendation is presented with uh, Mr. Mollica's suggestion to include the, uh, what is it called, the sound report? Yeah, the sound yeah. study as an exhibit. Sound study. To the the sound study as an exhibit to the resolution. I'll, I'll accept that. I'll, I'll second it. All right, moved and seconded. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye, it's unanimous. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Thomas, much. thank you very much for your help. 1025, we got... Uh, and good luck in Washington. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We got one more. Um, 5F. Staff report, please. This is... Uh, uh, <laughs> probably ought to say what it is. Item 5F on the agenda. It's a coastal development permit and a demolition permit, an application for an interior and exterior remodel and exterior site improvements. 33616 Pacific Coast Highway. Staff report. Parker, do we have the PowerPoint? All right. <laughs> Good evening, Chair Jennings, a member of the Planning Commission. The item you have before you tonight is CDP number 2008 and demolition permit number 2003. Um, the project is going to consist of um, a remodel of an existing 8,540 square foot single family residence. This includes the demolition of 98 square feet and the demolition of 4% of exterior walls. It also includes the demolition of an exterior staircase that's located on the bluff top that was built by the previous owner without the benefit of permits. Um, other site improvements include a new entry gate, a new water fountain, a new swimming pool measuring 33 feet, five inches long by 10 feet, six inches wide, a new metal roofing that will not exceed the existing roof height, um, and new exterior siding. Um, there's no photos, so I guess <laughs> that really concludes my staff report. I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. Um, exterior, uh, <laughs> ex parte communications? None today. None. None. Uh, I was at the original hearing for the original house, but none. Uh, site visit and spoke to the architect, but nothing that's not already in the report. Steve? Steve? None. Okay. None. Okay, uh, let's open the public hearing. We have uh, 
Jeanette Tang, and Joseph. Oh, the Joseph, there he is. Uh, uh, are you going to do the presentation? Uh, just a quick thank you for sticking out uh, the night. I know it's late for everybody, so I appreciate it, Chair Jennings and members of the Planning Commission, as well as Bonnie and staff. Uh, myself as the applicant and Jeanette as a project architect are here for any questions that you may have. Is there anybody else in the audience who uh, wants to address the commission on this item? All right, hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. Come back to the commission table for comments, questions, clean sheet project. I'm nothing. Nothing? You disappoint I, me. I got, I got something. Um, sorry, it just caught my attention that when I was re reviewing the background, it said there was approval for 5,400 square feet, but then the project was listed at something like 8,000. I wasn't sure how that gap got there. It also included some covered porches. There's large covered porches area to the rear that was covered. Um, I can, if you give me a second, let me look at the original approval. Yeah, because I mean, just, just to be explicit, on page six, it says clearly allowed required 5,500, proposed 8,400, existing non-conforming, but then all the approvals came in in 2000, like after cityhood. So it, it, I, I'm guessing that the rule for the um, six foot overhang probably wasn't in effect now that you're saying that. Yes, I believe the the approval um, predates that. Rule. So effectively, we've got like a fifty four hundred square foot home with another three thousand or some odd square foot of six foot covered decks. There's also a non conforming basement area okay. on the lower level. And that was built yes, how does that without a permit. No, that was built with permit. Non, How is it non-conforming? Non-conforming, it wasn't included. To the current in basement foot. standards. Right, it wasn't included in square foot. Oh, wait. So, sorry. That it was included within the square footage. That's why it's at the 8,000. Then what's non-conforming? Yes, I'm sorry. It wasn't then. It is now. <laughs> sorry for the confusion. So, to put that another way, if we did a TDSF calc on this place right now, it would be 5388 for that livable standard space then we'd have another we'd let the first thousand go on the basement we pick up the half of the 1400 another 700 plus we'd have another roughly 3,000 square feet in covered balconies those two rules came on after this thing was approved Does that sound right it wouldn't be 700 it'd be a thousand well my, it's a 2400 square foot oh, basement. I'm sorry okay yeah I got my mouth full. All right, I just, I just want to make sure I get it. I'm just, yeah, it just caught my attention. Uh, not a problem. So I think if we could just backpedal the statement about there being 3,000 square feet of covered balconies. Um, as it existed before we submitted a project, there was only 410 square feet there. Um, now we're going with 384. Uh, your math about the basement is correct. Um, it's my understanding at the time that the project was originally constructed, the basement rules were different. It was completely exempt along with the garage. So now when we're looking at it through current codes and our, our current goggles on, the square footage is different. But at the time, there was a lot more exempt square footage. That's why we're seeing that skew. But you're, you're saying that almost 3,000 square feet uh, minus 300 square feet of additional uh, Overhangs was in the original project. That, that, yes. So how, um, how does that happen? So there, it it's can't all be in the basement. It's not that big. Um, the basement covers um, a majority of the first floor footprint. I mean, the the basement right now is at twenty four hundred ninety four square feet. I'm going to try a clarification really quick, John. I'm, I'm guessing when you did that calc on the TDSF, you took the full basement size. Correct. Yeah, that's why. So they didn't take. The minus 1,000 taken in half. Why would you do that? Is that TDSF number then incorrect? Per current code, I believe. Correct, per current code. So that's incorrect. You, you took the full thing or you took the 1,000 feet off of it? Seems like we're off like 1,500 feet. You took the full square footage for per what was existing. Then, now, Richard, my question is if this was the current codes, TDSF wouldn't take the full square footage. That's why I'm mystified. Yes, under 
what Jessica did was she captured uh, a one for one, as, as Commissioner Marks is pointing out. Uh, you're right, the basement's 2,400, so the basement would uh, come out to uh, 700 square feet under today's code, if I'm not mistaken. That and, number's overstated. Yes, the 8,000 is overstated. And then also, I believe, too, on the covered balconies, uh, um, just to add some further clarification, there was a brief period of time, two, three years, when Zoe races, that interpretation changed and covered balconies were excluded from the calculations. And at that time, this house was, um, was approved. But we did do a final inspection on the house. And with the exception of the staircase, which is being uh, addressed this evening, they did build the house per the CDP as approved by the city. Okay, so do we need to correct anything? Uh, we're giving them an entire, we're not giving them an entitlement for 8442, right? No, the, the resolution is the actual approval and it, it just lists the scope of work. Yeah, so but it just says. Yeah. On page. Resolution, what page? Ah, so um, condition number two, it just talks about con remodel of the existing house. So if there's an update we need to make to the square footage in um, condition 2A, we can do that. Okay. And now, I probably know the answer to this, but Richard, that, that funky wall built on top of the pile of dirt, is that still considered legal? The one in the front? Um, I echoed the same concerns that you had when they were building it. So I remember looking into it and it was allowed because the pile of dirt, and Norm could I'm sure speak to this too, as he was there. Uh, at that time that was looked at as an existing condition. And so it was just a fence placed on top of that pile of, of dirt. Uh, the dirt, since it was considered existing topography, did not contribute to the height of the wall. That's okay. how it was approved. And then the second question is, is this all at all associated with the property to the south on that corner? Uh, no. Directly next door to it? No. Okay. So that's not this property's wall. I believe you're talking about 608, but this is separate. Well, that's where you drive down the hill to the other house we looked at last week. No. Okay, that's not it. Okay. So that's just a code violation. Okay. Make a motion to approve staff recommendation. Uh, I, would just, I would ask that you uh, uh, condition the square footage change. Yeah, amend the, to the appropriate to today's standards. I, I would think do we agree on that? Yeah, I agree. No problem. Yeah. Was it seconded? Is there anything else, Richard? Did you have anything to, to staff changes? No, only condition item line two A. I think it is there. The first one will change that. Okay, that'll just list the specific square footage you approved. Okay. Aye. 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 Motion to adjourn. I Second. want to adjourn to uh, to say that we actually finished this in time and we had a six minute hearing. Okay. Thank you, Paul Grisanti. I knew you could do uh, it. You can leave this and we'll fill it for you. That stuff you can.